in Santa Maria. I'm the director of the competition. And today we have our final round of competition with our seven startups competing for over $1 million in prizes. Let's get started. We'd like you to watch this instructional video for our judges and our startups to tell you more about the competition and what's going to take place today. Hello, I'm Catherine Santa Maria, director of the Rice Business Plan Competition, and I'm here with Brad Burke, managing director of the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. You are joining over 200 judges who have registered to participate in the 2021 RBPC and a record 54 startups. Over the next few minutes, we will review the instructions for judging. These are crucial to ensure a fair and well-run event. Please make sure to check out the more detailed judging instructions available at the rbpc.rice.edu slash judges website. RBPC will take place on the Whova event management platform. This is where you will log on each day to participate in the competition. It integrates with Zoom, so you only need to come to one place, Whova, to participate in the RBPC. All scoring is still done in the online judging platform by Poetic Systems. For returning judges, this is what you used last year. All registered judges have been given access to the judging platform. You can log into the judging platform on your mobile phone, tablet, laptop, or desktop on a separate browser than the competition itself. This means you have two websites to manage during the competition. Whova for the presentations and the judging platform for scoring. Your attendance in the morning is crucial. All rounds begin promptly at 9 a.m. and run until roughly 11.30 a.m. Please be prompt so you can watch and listen to each pitch in full and watch and listen to all the pitches in the flight. Your scores will be invalid if you do not. We will be taking attendance in each pitch. Each pitch is 10 minutes and will include the startup team members on camera along with their pitch deck. Judges will see both the presenter and the pitch deck on the screen at the same time. Each 10 minute presentation is followed by a 10 minute Q&A session with the judges. Judges will ask a question by using the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate they want to ask a question and the moderator will call on that judge and the judge must unmute themselves and quickly ask their question. Judges can also ask a question in the chat function in Zoom and the moderator will read the question to the startup. There is limited time for Q&A. Please ask your question quickly and fully. Be concise and constructive with your questions. Do not offer opinions, feedback, or lengthy buildup to your questions. Follow and respect the moderator's instructions and decisions during the flight. There is a two minute break between pitches with a six minute break after the third pitch. Only registered judges can ask questions. Judges will enter their scores in the online judging platform at the end of the flight after all the startups have pitched and the last Q&A has concluded. Judges will rank the six startups they see in their flights. Rank them from one, which is the best investment potential or opportunity, through six, which is the poorest investment potential or opportunity. Wait until you have heard all the pitches to submit your ranking of the startups. Judges will have roughly 10 minutes to enter their scores after the last Q&A has concluded. Please be conscious of the time and work quickly. The two top scoring startups from each of the nine round one flights will advance to the semifinal round. That's 18 startups total in the semifinals. In the semifinal round, there are three flights of six startups each. The two top scoring startups from each of the three semifinal round flights, plus the next top scoring startup from across all three flights will advance to the final round. That's seven startups in the final round. We are committed to fostering an environment that is inclusive and non-discriminatory. Judges' evaluations should not be influenced by race, gender, sexual orientation, or national origin. 
We expect all judges to treat all participants respectfully and equally and be conscientious of their biases. If judges or startups observe anyone acting in a way that is not consistent with these principles, please contact me, Catherine, the RBPC director at rbpc at rice.edu or Lina Bell, director of diversity and inclusion for the Gen School at lybell at rice.edu. Let's talk about how to judge. Our judges act as early stage investors. They are determining which startups represent the best investment opportunity. Judges should rank the startups where they would most likely invest their money if they were early stage investors. Give top ranking to the startups that give the most compelling case on why they will be successful and those that provide evidence that they are committed to take this startup to market. Look at the startups that have the best potential of return on investment. For each startup, ask yourself, if I were an investor in early stage companies, would I put my money behind this company and these founders? A list of potential questions to ask the startups is in your judge packet that was emailed to you last week. The 54 startups of the Rice Business Plan competition were selected by a screening panel from more than 400 applicants. In our virtual competition, we made a few rule changes to reflect our new environment. Each startup should have at least two members present for each pitch, but only one member is required to make the pitch. Up to four members can split the pitching duties if they choose. In this environment, startups may pitch from the location that makes them the most comfortable. They can sit or they can stand, and they can choose to pitch from memory or read from a prepared remarks. All teams have been vetted and confirmed that they are eligible and meet the requirements to compete at the RBPC. However, if you see or hear something from a team that differs from the RBPC rules, feel free to email Catherine, the director at rbpc at rice.edu with your concerns. We will assess the issue and consult PKF Texas, the official auditing firm of the RBPC, if needed. Do not challenge the startup or disrupt the session by focusing on that issue. Continue to score and evaluate the startup as usual. We want our judges to be inspired, to learn about new technologies, to meet student startups, give valuable advice, and give constructive feedback, and offer to help. Be positive, be a role model, be impactful. Have a wonderful competition and get ready to watch some innovative and impactful pitches from high caliber startups. Let's get started, judges. Please make sure that you can log on to the judging platform by Poetic Systems, click on today's round, and you will see the six startups that will pitch to you this morning. They are in the same order as they are presenting this morning in Zoom. At the end of the flight, rank the startups that you have seen in order of one would be the best investment opportunity down to six, which would be the poorest investment opportunity. When finished, click Submit. You will get a confirmation screen, and then you are done. Scoring will close 10 minutes after the end of the last Q&A session, so please submit your scores by that time. And then join us about an hour after the end of the flight to hear the winners who will advance to the next round of competition. Good morning. This is the live version of Brad Burke, the Managing Director of the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. And I'm pleased this morning to introduce Peter Rodriguez, the Dean of the Jones Graduate School of Business. Peter is coming up on being the Dean of the school on his five years now. And under his leadership, the school has made great progress over the last several years. The school has launched a new Rice online MBA program the school has grown to the largest number of students ever in the history of the school, and it's currently launching an undergraduate business major. Under Peter's watch, the school for the first time ever has been ranked number one in entrepreneurship, and not just for one year, but for two years in a row. And Peter, I would say all of this, even if you weren't our boss, you're welcome. Peter Rodriguez this morning, the Dean of the Jones Graduate School of Business. Well, thank you, Brad, and thank you to everyone for having me here today. I can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of this opportunity and to be a part of the Rice Business Plan competition. 
Uh, I get goosebumps when I watch you pitch on Thursday. It's the most exciting time of the year. It is the NCAA Tournament of Capitalism, uh, and it gives me a great warm feeling to be even a small part of the mission of the Rice Business uh, Plan Competition and the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. On behalf of the Jones Graduate School of Business, everyone at Rice University, I just want to welcome all of you and offer my congratulations to all the teams that have participated and especially those who are going to participate today in these uh, preparation for the final rounds of pitches. You know, what you can do, your ability to combine science and work through business to solve problems for the world is a great inspiration to all of us. It's something that draws together Houstonians and people from around the world for this, the largest and richest business competition there is. It's been a really tough year, but all of you have kept pushing and you've gotten here today to bring us your stories and in the hope that there are sunnier days ahead. I know that for some of you, you have a very bright future starting immediately. And I think that all of you have a very bright future very, very soon. I also wanna emphasize that you should be especially proud of just being here right now. You're part of the most competitive cohort in the history of the Rice Business Plan competition. For the first time ever, we invited 12 additional startups. So as you know, there've been 54 as compared to 42 and you've earned your place here. You should be all very, very proud of getting this far. I can't wait to get started. I know you can too. I know the judges are ready. So let's get ready to see the final round of pitches and see who takes home the grand prize. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. A reminder to everyone that's watching, uh, if you'd like to view the elevator pitch competition that is was from Tuesday, that's on our website along with information about the 54 startups that we invited to the RBPC this year. It was very difficult to narrow it down to seven finalists, but that is who we're going to see now. Let's kick off our final round. A reminder, uh, during the final round, judges, during the Q&A session, you will put questions into the Q&A box to be read to the startups. All questions should be in the Q&A box and I will read them to the startups for the Q&A session here today. So let's kick off with our first startup. We have Swift Skew here with us. Hello, Can hello. you share your screen? Let's get you set up. All right. Are you guys able to see it? We can see your screen. So just a reminder, you will have 10 minutes to pitch. And then I will follow with 10 minutes of Q&A with the judges who will place the questions in the Q&A function. And then I will read them to you. So when you are ready, Swift Skew, I will start uh, timing and then I will let you know when your time is up. So please begin when you're ready. Hello, I'm Ip Patel. Hi, I'm Daniel Mazur. We are building the operating system for the $650 billion convenience store industry. Our solution connects to point of sale systems at convenience stores in real time, letting owners manage and monitor their stores. We founded SwiftSkew because of the pain we saw in the independent convenience store space. Daniel and I met when we had lockers next to each other in sixth grade, and we've been best friends since. As children of immigrants, we connected right away. Daniel's parents immigrated from Ukraine and mine from India. My parents came to America and saved for years until they could buy their first convenience store. And naturally, I grew up doing everything from inventory and price book management to reporting and accounting. And when vendors would come by, I would be the translator between them and my parents. My story isn't an outlier either. This is a story of the tens of thousands of convenience stores in America owned by Indian families like mine. In the US, there are 153,000 convenience stores or C stores, of which 96,000 are independently owned. Of the independents, 93% are Indian immigrants and 72% are Gujarati. Gujaratis come from the state of Gujarat in India and English isn't their native language. We decided to serve this majority by providing customer service and support in Hindi, Gujarati, and English. Our multilingual support and cultural awareness has made our customer base extremely loyal. Our all-time retention is 100%. Our customers love what we have done for their business and believe in our vision. 80.8% of convenience stores are gas stations and require a compliant point of sale system for their pumps and can't use systems like Square or Stripe. The C-Store point of sale market is dominated by Verifone and Gilbarco. 
with Verifone having more than 75% of the U.S. market. This is the point of sale you'd buy today from Verifone as a C-Store owner. Aside from the terrible user experience and lack of management controls, these registers are also notoriously difficult to pull transaction data out of. As an official Verifone partner, SwiftSkew is able to attach to the point of sale to extract the previously unattainable transaction data with our proprietary T-log parsing algorithm. Just to avoid losing their transaction data, owners are forced to collect these 15 foot long end of day reports every single day. They do this because their point of sale data is being deleted after 90 days, which is a real shame considering that convenience stores make up one third of retail in America. This is where we step in. With our solution, this priceless transaction data that represents 3.1% of America's GDP is preserved. And today we do two things with this data. One, we help owners manage their stores with our back office solution that lets them manage their inventory, price book, and even remotely manage their fuel pumps. Two, we facilitate the data interchange between stores and brands. Now, starting with our back office solution, we give owners data insights without having to deal with these end of day printouts and five subject notebooks. We bring convenience stores into the 21st century. Owners no longer have to keep paper copies of receipts for every single transaction. We let owners move around their stores, scan items in, and manage their price book straight from the app. Whereas before, they would have to bring every single one of their items up to the register and change each one of their thousands of SKU prices one by one. I'm sure you have seen the orange price stickers on chips or M&Ms at a convenience store. Well, those prices aren't there for you as a consumer. They're there because owners can't expect their cashiers to memorize their prices like they have. This is the state of price book management in much of the industry today, and it gives you an idea of just how much there is left for us to disrupt. It's also important to note that C-Store owners rarely make money from fuel, and if you pay with a credit card at the pump, the owner is often losing money on that transaction. Their entire success relies on driving foot traffic into their store and making the right decisions when it comes to inside sales. Since we already have all of their transaction data, owners are able to join scan data programs where SwiftSkew submits their transaction level data to brands. In return, owners are able to provide discounts and loyalty rewards to their customers paid for by the brands at the end of each month. The brands win because they only pay out these reimbursements if SwiftSkew proves the owner passed on the discount or reward to the consumer. Consumers win because they get lower prices, and C-Store owners win because they are able to maintain the same profit margin while undercutting the competitors down the street. C-Stores in their first month on SwiftSkew's loyalty program see an average increase of 5% in sales volume. This is a game changer for our customers. And for stores on the SwiftSkew loyalty program, consumers get an additional loyalty reward by simply entering their phone number into the pin pad. And as we get more stores and more brands, a network effect is created because brands will have more to gain and more brands will join the network, which in turn provides stores more rewards and the positive feedback loop continues. This also forms an additional competitive moat because as a baseline, any new competitor in this space will have to offer all the brands that are on our network to be competitive. Store owners wouldn't have an incentive to sign up for another competitor because we would have more brands on our network, meaning that owners will get more rewards on our network. This also allows us to decrease our customer acquisition cost because the sales reps from the brands that are on our network will start referring owners start using our platform. Currently, we already have sales reps referring stores to us because their commission is tied to the store's performance and getting a store enrolled in scan data increases store performance. Our customer acquisition is also driven by referrals within the tight knit Indian community. We offer one month free to the refer and one month free for new convenience stores. This has resulted in our organic spread to 16 states. In the last few months since Y Combinator started, we've doubled in the last 24 hours, we've added eight more stores and we now have 193 paying stores and we've never lost a single customer. Our retention is 100%. Aside from loving SwiftSkew, customers stick around because we are their single source of truth for all of their business data. To date, we've collected over $100 million in transactions from C-Store point of sales. Our growth rate has been 
38.9% month over month, and conservatively, we will reach 6,000 C stores and 3.4 million in ARR in 18 months. We started fundraising three weeks ago, and as of this morning, we've raised over $1 million. And with this round of funding, we will hire key engineers, roll out our accounting module, and integrate with the Gilbarco point of sale, allowing us to penetrate the remaining 23% of the market. Until recently, convenience stores got away with using outdated point of sale systems. But on April 17th, in eight days, the EMV compliance deadline is forcing them to upgrade a new point of sale systems that have granular SKU data, making analytics and loyalty programs possible. COVID has also made remote management and reordering a must for owners because commission-based sales reps are the primary way a distributor knows to replenish inventory. And when sales reps stopped showing up at lower volume stores, convenience store shelves started going empty. Everybody is losing in this picture, brands, distributors, retailers, and consumers. So to pull it all together, C stores in the US process 650 billion in transactions annually, most of which is being deleted. Nobody's disrupted this market yet because frankly, you've got to be a Gujarati like my co-founder Mitt here to do it. We already have 193 C stores in 16 states and have collected over $100 million in transactions. And most importantly, because we are tied into the point of sale directly, we're in directly in the flow of revenue in and out of the store, which is what unlocks these huge monetization opportunities for SwiftSkew. Thank you. Thank you very much, SwiftSkew. I'm going to start reading some questions from the chat. So again, judges, please put your questions in the Q&A function, the uh, uh, Q&A function, not the chat, and I will start reading them to the startup. So first question, um, can you please elaborate on how you access the POS database? We uh, have a hardware device, the IQ module, that interfaces directly with the point of sale system. So owners simply have to plug it in and it starts taking that data out. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, do I understand your total revenue potential correctly? Fully deployed, you have about 60,000 stores at $40 a month for a max of 28 million. Are there other revenue sources? There are other revenue sources. The $40 is what we currently have to get market share, but we already are going to be releasing our accounting tier this summer, which will be priced at $350 per month. And that allows for owners to automate away the accounting that they're currently paying five to $600 per month to accountants to do and pay their interns essentially to parse through those crates of receipts that they have. And also the independent C-store demographic is 96,000, not 60,000. And our TAM isn't limited just to the US. This is a global problem that we're solving. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what does a 5% increase in sales mean in actual dollars for the average convenience store monthly? It depends on convenience stores because on average, a convenience store does about 1.3 million in sales annually, but there are some locations that are significantly under that range and some that are higher. And so it, it, uh, it depends on the type of convenience store and the location. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, since the uh, Biden administration is going to accelerate uh, electric vehicle adoption, what's going to happen to gas stations around the country uh, with this uh, potential new uh, shift toward electric? Well, we're not entirely sure how the gas pumps will evolve because of having an increased adoption in electric vehicles. We do know that we're helping owners drive inside sales. And that's regardless of if they have pumps outside or not. Convenience stores don't have to have gas stations. And so we're in the business of helping owners optimize their sales based off of what they're doing inside. And so the Biden administration rolling out more of the EV regulation doesn't it directly affect us. Thank you. Uh, have you considered or would you consider convenience stores outside of the U.S. at some point? We would. We've actually already started speaking with entities that represent convenience stores in Russia, Korea, China, Brazil, Egypt, and Brazil, and, and Japan. All right. Uh, next question. If CPGs, distributors, and stores will be connected on one platform for the first time, how does that impact scaling? 
it allows us to roll out to more convenience stores even faster because distributors and brands will have the ability to actually gain more insights into how these stores are processing their SKUs. Distributors because they understand the inventory requirements at a more granular level and brands because they understand the consumer purchasing habits that they previously haven't had access to. Thank you. We had two questions on uh, EMV. Uh, can you tell us more about the EMV compliance requirement and can you please elaborate on the EMV deadline? Right, so the EMV deadline is April 17th and EMV is essentially the chip card readers that you guys all have with like credit cards with chips on them. Convenience stores still haven't been uh, accepting them. And so that this deadline it forces them to actually upgrade their systems to start accepting those at the pump and inside. Thank you. Um, next question. How many stores would an owner need to seriously consider your product uh, out of 193 stores uh, how, and how many individual owners? We have around 150 individual owners, but the vast majority of them do own one. But we, our largest customer has 11 stores. Great. Next question. Can you please speak more to your revenue model? as well as the contract subscription terms and the tenor for your customers. Right, it's a subscription-based model where they can enroll in several tiers where they can get scan data, scan data benefits along with the back office benefits and this summer also get access to the accounting and payroll. All right, thank you. Uh, for the owners, do they need to install any extra hardware uh, and are you involved after this uh, system is installed? It's all remote. Owners simply have to just plug in two cables, Ethernet and power. And it's a simple IoT setup, the way you would set up your Google Home or Google or Amazon Alexa device. And after they've set this up, it takes 15 minutes to onboard them for one phone call before they can start using the app. And once they start using the app, we're also able to pull in the previous three months worth of data and give them analytics on that as well. Thank you. Um, next question. Can you explain your sales plan to reach 6,000 stores? Right. So right now, the brands that are on our network, their sales reps are going to convenience stores and referring our products to them as well. But also because we're eliminating so much pain for these convenience store owners, they're telling their friends and family members about it. And because this is a tight-knit group of, uh, a tight-knit group of, uh, customers, we actually started off with like two or three stores in Alabama, which has blossomed to 16 states because they're connected all over, all over the United States. What we found is the tight knit communities will spread it and plant seeds in different states. And then the sales reps in the regions will start circulating it as they start feeling these benefits and their own paychecks. Thank you. Uh, can you please describe how you expect your larger uh, competitors to respond to this uh, and what would be how would you react to a larger competitor in this space? I mean, frankly, if, if a larger competitor came in, uh, they'd have to one, understand the tiny nuances of running a convenience store. And also, we also have the competitive mode of having the brands on our network that are incentivized to stay on our network because we already have this data that we're collecting because it's historical data, right? The data is being deleted. And so a competitor that's coming in, let's say starting today, doesn't have any of that historical transaction history that we do. And Bob on our team has done a lot of work in intellectual property. He's filed over 90 patents and been issued 47 patents in the U.S. And we're currently formalizing our trade secret program within uh, SwiftSkew. And we're considering what exactly, which uh, patents exactly we'll be filing. But there is quite a bit of IP that we are generating. Thank you. Uh, an interesting question. Uh, what, is the, what are the cybersecurity implications for your platform? There really aren't any cybersecurity implications for us because we're not processing any of the sensitive information like credit card data directly. It's just transaction data, and that's not part of that. Excellent. Uh, and a few questions on, um, is your solution limited to mom and pop stores and gas stations? Um, what is your uh, solution for new segments or where do you see more opportunity? 
it's not only for mom and pop shops. That's where we're starting off because that's where we're able to solve the most pain. But as we get larger, we're able to actually service the smaller chains that we're now lar like larger than. For example, right now, SwiftSQ, if we were a convenience store chain, we'd be the 42nd largest convenience store chain in the U.S. And we provide similar network benefits as if we were a chain to our customers that were previously fragmented independence. Thank you. A few questions about uh, Verifone. Is your critical relationship with Verifone positive or might they vertically, vertically integrate your functions and take you out of the market? So another competition question. They are not. They would actually love for us to continue expanding our platform because it means they get to sell more of their point of sale systems and continue processing more of the world's non-cash transactions. They right now already process 46%. Thank you. And uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your data storage? How are you managing it? What's the liability? We, right, we don't have uh, any liability and right now it's stored in uh, the AWS cloud that we use. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about your, your team and uh, what you're looking for uh, from uh, to raise uh, what money you're looking to raise and what you see as your next steps as you develop your company. So our team is pretty small. We're pretty nimble. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we will become profitable at 230 C stores. In terms of uh, next steps, uh, we are going to be releasing our accounting module as well as uh, a few other different tiers that our customers have been asking for. And, and actually scaling out more of that engineering team. Excellent. And let's see, we have time for one or two more questions which are coming in fast and furious. Um, what is your, uh, do you have a five-year revenue forecast and what type of exit are you looking for? Well, as a startup, our, uh, we do have a five-year revenue forecast. It just won't mean anything in five years. <laughs> and in terms, of, uh, in terms of exits, we've got several potential acquires, uh, ranging from point of sale vendors that are looking to enter the space to distributors that are wanting to become the sole distributor and have all the convenience stores on their network, to brands who want to get more insights and analytics on their SKUs and products. And um, let's see. Um, let's see, can you go into more detail about your customer loyalty program and how stores are getting signed up for that, that process? So we're integrated directly into the point of sale system. So all, whenever a customer onboards, like a convenience store owner, they simply just have to let their customers know, put in your phone number on the pin pad and you can unlock all of these rewards directly at the point of sale. They don't have to give out loyalty cards or any physical membership cards. And it's one phone number that they can use at any convenience store that's on our network. And it lets brands have relationships with individual consumers through rewards for the first time in many cases. And I'll do one last question. Um, who owns the data? Is it you or the customer? Uh, and where does who takes it with them? We we own the data. Okay, great. I'll, I can ask one more question. And uh, let's see. Um, got a lot of questions. Um, are there other technology players who will need to integrate with uh, your product and what challenges do you foresee with any integrations? There, as of right now, there aren't uh, any players that would want to integrate with us, but we are thinking about opening up some of our APIs to accelerate uh, adoption by more point of sale vendors. Because ultimately we'll be a platform or an ecosystem rather than just this one puzzle piece that we made today appear to be. Wonderful. Thank you very much, SwiftSkew. Thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent job. Thank you to the judges for all of their questions. Excellent. We're now going to move to our second presentation. The second startup today is Simple. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can awesome. hear you. Great. Hello. Thank you, can you Can you hear me? Uh, let's see. Yes, Jai, I can hear you well. Thank you. Can, can so you hear me here? Uh, hear everyone. Let's get your Perfect. presentation up. And we've got a little bit of breather time. So I'd like to give the judges a minute or two just to collect their thoughts, take any notes. 
And you can see this presentation up here? Yes, I can see it very Perfect. clearly. Thank you. Awesome. Great. So as a reminder, all the judges are putting their questions into the Q&A box and I will be reading them to you uh, as they come in, as many as I can in our 10 minute question and answer time. Thank you. All right, so simple. Uh, you are ready to go. I will start the clock when you are ready. So welcome to Simple. We're an AI computer vision rehabilitation software representing the University of Pittsburgh. And so I went through this inefficient patient journey. When I was 18, I just got my personal training certification, thought I knew how to work out, but then ended up blowing out my disc. And so I could barely get out of bed. I could barely get to class. Um, but the physical... Um, you know, the doctors told me I had to go to physical therapy. Physical therapy is super expensive. The average person with back pain spends 1260 for eight to 10, eight to 10 sessions of, of rehab. And it's also very time expensive. You, gotta, you have to actually go to the clinic and, you know, it's, it's a huge commitment. And additionally, um, you know, if that doesn't work, they offer you opioids. 9.7 million Americans last year abused opioids, costing the country $38 billion. And, you know, if these modalities don't work, you have to go to surgery. And, and, you know, back in November of this year, four years after the injury, I ended up having a, a, a surgery that put me back into physical therapy. And, and this whole cycle just keeps happening. And if you're one of the lucky people that are able to make it out of surgery, re-injury risks are, are, are still there. So this is also a monetarily expensive problem. MSK conditions, musculoskeletal, so back pain, neck pain, shoulder, knee and hip. I know we've all had it. Um, cost the U.S. $600 billion. And... When you break down that $600 billion, 261 is in direct spending, so PT and such, as I mentioned, and then indirect spending in lost productivity, missed work days. The average employee misses 11.4 work days a year due to MSK conditions. So currently, physical therapists will measure you with a subjective archaic method. Um, this is a compass-looking device called a goniometer, and it's, you know, inaccurate. And so our solution in 2021 is an objective evidence-based solution. We have a home and database exercise coaching platform built to optimize your rehab outcomes. We use computer vision and AI to power our proprietary technology, providing you motion tracking, real-time audio and visual feedback to make sure you do the exercises properly. Our exercises are evidence-based. So we work with the University of Pittsburgh's number one PT school in the world to ensure that these exercises are gonna be safely performed. And we have personalized home exercise programs, ensuring that you're progressing when your body's actually ready to progress. So how it works, you download our app on the App Store. It's being used in 17 countries. And um, you basically have a body map. We know that all pain isn't equal. So as you can see here, throbbing, stabbing, shooting, nerve pain, whatever you have, um, you localize that on the body. Next, we have a zero to 10 scale to see what the magnitude of that pain is and a mental health assessment because we know that plays a huge role in your rehab process. All of this data is stored and sent back to your provider, you know, should they choose. And you have a self-managed computer vision driven workout. So Ben here's performing his exercises. You see the motion tracking on his body and you see a visual and audio cue. Um, the reps are also counted automatically. So again, all of this data gets sent over to your provider and this makes the entire physical therapy process more objective. So simple is easy to use. Here's an assist from an NBA Hall of Famer. For this year's Young Entrepreneur Award with more Here's Cowboys linebacker Jalen Smith to share our winner. Thanks, Magic. I'm here with Young Entrepreneur Award winner, uh, Simple. So as you can see here, this patient sets up his phone and starts completing his exercises. It's that easy. And, and as you can see, the motion tracking is working great. Real-time audio and visual feedback and automatic rep counting. So very, very simple to use. Our first revenue stream is direct to consumer model. We charge users $12 a month and $108 a year. And our top B2C traction channels are PT clinics. We give the app to PTs for free and every patient that they sign up, um, there's a revenue share. Additionally, targeting blogs and social media campaigns and such, we've been working with some of the top influencers in the physical therapy space, totaling to over 5 million followers. So the market opportunity is huge. This is just with people with back pain and because that, that's where we're starting. 1.43 trillion, um, dollars in the global market and 517 billion in the US market. 
And when you look at you know, who we're targeting specifically, 2 million smartphone proficient users in the US direct to consumer market at $12 a month will generate us 288 million in ARR. Again, this is a global problem. We've all had this, this sort of, these sorts of pains. And our second revenue stream is licensing the technology. So companies such as Hinge Health, who are the existing MSK solution for employers, they have hardware. In the bottom right here, you see the woman performing the exercises with straps, but after a long day of work, it's really difficult to set up these straps and it adds 10 to 15 extra minutes to set up. We want to eliminate this clunky hardware and, and, and expect similar pain reduction, mental health improvements, and medical savings. So the market opportunity, physical therapy and OT clinics, it's about a $35 billion market. Digital health clinics, $40 billion market with 33% annual growth rate. And health and fitness clubs is a $35 billion market. So when you look at the global TAM here, this is a quarter trillion dollar opportunity. Everyone, this is a big deal. You know, we've all been there with this pain. And when we look at a successful case study with one of our direct-to-consumer users, you can see here they had nerve pain, sharp pain, and dull pain throughout their, throughout their extremities. And using Simple Daily, they found an 80% pain reduction and centralization of symptoms. So now they only have dull pain in the middle of their body, which is great. And we know that that's only one case. And that's why we're conducting a joint clinical study with Pitt's physical therapy department in Stanford Medicine and an Amazon warehouse in South Carolina, where we're going to be accelerating the rehab um, of workplace injuries and looking at the economic reduction in workers' comp and such. So we're also working with the Stone Clinic and IV Rehab, providing an at-home solution to improve adherence and rehab outcomes. And additionally, uh, we want to license technology to the Penguins Lifetime and National Academy of Sports Medicine to, to their existing client management platforms, empowering them with this data and this computer vision technology. So huge, huge opportunities here. And our go-to-market strategy to achieve these is you know, in March of 2021, we released our MVP. Again, it's being used in 17 countries around the globe. This is a huge global problem. And the data collection um, at the Stone Clinic has just begun. So we're really excited to be working with them. In July, we're starting our clinical study with Pitt PT, Stanford, and Amazon. And then we're going to be charging direct to consumer in January. We, we then plan to license the computer vision technology to Hinge Health and other MSK providers. So our projected revenue conservatively in 2022 is 5 million, assuming 5,000 new users signed up a month and a 1% licensing fee. And in 2023, we project 13. And we've won a number of awards this year. So um, in addition to Magic Johnson and the NFL Players Association, Amazon named us a top 10 university startup in the country and a lot of top engineering universities have given us awards. So we're very, very grateful for the support over these years. And so our team, uh, my background's in neuroscience and computer science. I um, have done research in relevant fields. Jay has done research at Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Genalia. He's also my best friend. Um, Bell is helping us with creating machine learning scripts for these, for these exercises. And Chris Burns has 35 years of experience. He served on the board of Cigna, AIG, a number of health plans. So very, very uh, deep expertise here. And Sean Dooley is our medical student helping us with the research. The very unique aspect of our team is that we've gathered students across the globe to help us solve this problem. And we've created an internship opportunity where students were able to get college credit to work on this problem. We're very coachable and we're very hungry. So when looking at our academic advisors, Dr. Milstein, he's the director of the clinical excellence program at Stanford Medicine. He's gonna be leading our clinical trial. And we've been working with Pitt and CMU professors on the, on the continued growth of this product. Our investors and advisors. So we have computer vision experts, employee benefits experts, and former athletes, as well as business strategic advisors and physical therapy advisors. So the outcomes of our use of funds, we plan to use the money specifically building product development for our partnerships and strengthening up our engineering team. Additionally, user acquisition and marketing, you know, with 20% of, of, of our $1.5 million raise, uh, we can generate 30,000 users and 360K in revenue a month. And our clinical study, at the conclusion of that, we, we can start targeting health plans and employers directly, and the rest will go to legal fees. We have 640K committed to this round. And here's Chris, Ma Chris Niles. My name is Chris Niles. In 2011, I was in a tree cutting accident, left me paralyzed from the chest down. This is my simple story. I've always been a very active and athletic person. Even up to my accident, I was weight training, playing full contact football, and training for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. A year before my accident, I put the pads back on playing full contact football and competed for my first time in the Arnold Classic. That was a great experience. There was about 18 competitors in my division and I won my first gold medal. Since my accident, weight training can be a challenge. 
But with Simple, I'm able to work out with real-time feedback to keep myself healthy and injury-free. This is my Simple story. So the new simple patient journey, and this will be the journey that your kids and your grandkids go through if they get a sports injury, you know, injuries, physical therapy, simple reduction of pain and better outcomes. You know, we really thank you for your time. Our app is available in the app store right now. So feel free to check it out. And we're really grateful for the opportunity. You know, this technology is going to help the patients of tomorrow and the patients of today. So, you know, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Simple. All right, thank you very much, Simple. We have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I will read them to you as they come in through the uh, Q&A box from the judges. Um, let's see, can your app be used for injury prevention? And have you looked at partnering with uh, other exercise companies like, for example, Peloton? Yeah, absolutely. So. You know, we see a huge licensing opportunity in this space. Um, and we actually, you know, when we look at exit strategies, we think of, of Peloton as a potential acquirer because of this really powerful technology. The Peloton screens, as some of you may be using it, um, you know, has a camera embedded in it. So if we can provide the real-time feedback that they're looking at, um, if we can provide real-time feedback and, and, and empower their screens with this technology, we think that we can also reduce injuries. Peloton spent $54 million um, in bike recalls last year because people were getting hurt on the bike. So, you know, we think that there's a huge opportunity there. Thank you. Uh, next question. How do you anticipate or what do you anticipate to be the average time frame for usage or membership? And how is this incorporated uh, into your uh, business model? Yeah, so typically an average rehab plan is six to 12 weeks, but the, you know, with the great thing about our product is that it's continued, um, you know, continued usage after you have pain. So, you know, as someone with chronic pain, after the rehab period, the physical therapist strongly encouraged me to continue doing these exercises. But once I'm done with the clinic, you know, all of the progress that I'm making, there's no data storage happening. And none of that information is getting communicated back to the PT in case I get re-injured. The re-injury risks for herniated discs and ACL tears are incredibly high. So, um and at least in my, in my personal story, you know, I've been injured three times with my spinal cord after surgery, you know, it just keeps coming back. So um, this is the solution that I needed. And I know I've spoken with a number of you judges. Um, they've mentioned that the physical therapists that they've worked with want to see continued progress. So great. There's, there's great lifetime value here. Right. Thank you. Uh, next question. So there are, um, what is your competitive advantage? There are other companies and apps uh, in this space. Uh, what do you offer or how are you unique? Talk about uh, where you are in the landscape. Yeah, so when you look at the competitors, um, Kaya Health is the only computer vision rehab focused uh, app, but they only have a B2B model. So there's no direct to consumer option. And when looking at Exer, they're a fitness facing app. Um, and when looking at, and, and this is just a Zoom integration, so there's no actual app that's you know readily available and fully usable right now. Um, you Modus Hinge Health and Pfizer are all hardware-facing products, so you have to you know put on the clunky straps and such. And when you look at the competitive advantage, you know there's two things that I want to mention. First, our CV Tech has been more accurate um, because of our real-time motion tracking, and it's been developed by top engineers across the country. Additionally, it's less hardware-intensive, so. No mirror, um, you know, I know a lot of people look at Lululemon's mirror, they required for 500 million. They have a mirror where you can set it up in your house, but there's a huge barrier to entry for people to use it. Um, so for us, you already have a smartphone, it's already in your pocket and, and you can use it at any time. And it's also self-improving. So our machine learning model, as more people use the app, the models continuously improve, similar to Tesla. Jay, if you want to explain that. Um, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So like, you know, Tesla with all the data they collect as you, dri as you drive their vehicle, no one can compete with Tesla self-driving because of the massive amount of data that they have. Similarly, as we collect more data, our proprietary algorithm, algorithms will get better. And as our al algorithms get better, the patient gets better. It's a positive feedback loop. And additionally, when we look at the competitors in terms of ROI, you know, Hinge Health here costs $75 per employee per month. Kaya Health is $64 per employee per month. 
When we look at pain reduction, you know, we have to verify this with our clinical study, but our typical data shows around an 80% pain reduction. And the ROI, I mean, 25X to 4X to 1.6X. So we hope that answered your questions because we saw some, some of that in the feedback from, from the last round. So we hope to answer your questions. Thank you. I've got some questions about IP. Um, can you talk about your IP? Um, how do you expect to protect yourselves or your business um, from, from competition? Yeah, absolutely. So we use a combination of public AI and computer vision technology with our proprietary algorithms, pro proprietary software, and proprietary data. As we mentioned about Tesla, you know, as we collect more and more data, it, we generate a positive feedback loop and the barrier to entry for other companies constantly grows bigger. And with every employee and every contract that we've worked with, they've signed an invention assignment, giving any IP to simple. Jay, do you want to explain the rest of the legal questions while we're here? Yeah, so I'm sure you guys are wondering about HIPAA compliance, FDA, and liability. Uh, for HIPAA, we anonymize all the data. For FDA, because we're not currently diagnosing or prescribing any exercise routines, um, we don't require any FDA approval. We plan to do that after our clinical trial uh, with Stanford, in which we'll need an IRB approval and a 510 k uh, with our clinical data, which is standard for um, any FDA approval. And in terms of liability, we have the terms of service and contractual protection in the app to minimize any risk. And we're going to work with the necessary insurance providers. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, uh, I'm assuming that you have uh, physical therapist advisors that are helping train your computer vision. Have you tested to see whether one of your physical therapist advisors delivers different opinions uh, as to form or movement, uh, as to location? Uh, how does your technology compare with uh, an actual physical therapist? Yeah, so there's, there's you know, we, we want to empower physical therapists with an objective evidence-based tool to make the experience better, not replace them. Um, so when we look at the the individual, you know, tweaks that physical therapists look for, you know, we have a chat function. So these, there's going to be constant communication between your provider and your, and your uh, patient. And additionally, again, we're working with the number one school in physical therapy at the University of Pittsburgh. They're, you know, the, the leaders in this field, they set the standard for what physical therapy care looks like. And we're working hands-on with, with, you know, the chairmen of this, of this department to ensure that these exercises are scientifically backed. Great questions. Thank you. Oh, not, not to me, the judges. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's uh, next question. How long or short do you anticipate your sales cycle with each prospective customer? Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's a great question. I think, I think as we develop the product further and after we complete our clinical study, that's when we'll have more data about that. But right now, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't really have a, a, a data point for that answer yet. So, I, you know, I don't want to make something up for you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next one, is your machine learning or AI, uh, is it looking at information or segregating information on gender, age, BMI, and other uh, sports-related variables uh, as a matter of feedback? Could you, could you um, repeat the question, please? I didn't. Sorry, I just got disappeared from my, from my question roll. But yeah, so I mean, I think I heard something about sports and, and feedback and, you know, our, our technology is applicable in many different markets. So we're building features out for all MSK disorders, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, huge markets, online personal training, professional sports and collegiate sports. As we mentioned, we're working um, with the director of strength and conditioning at, at, at professional sports teams like the Penguins. And it's just been, it's just been super exciting. I think I can answer the question. Um, basically, you know, so when, when you're required to sign on, on or sign on to the app, we collect data about your uh, age, your gender, your race. Uh, and then we, we use all of that data in the machine learning model to basically train it so that you get the optimal experience when you're using simple. Got it. Thank and we you. also account for biases. We want to make sure that pain is being reported across. You know, we, we've, we've seen tons of research about the ethics of AI. So we're trying to eliminate biases from our machine learning model as well. Thank you. Um, let's see. You spoke about providing data to a user's therapist or medical staff to support further medical advice. Uh, does that diagnostic or therapeutic use uh, 
use your product, does that place your product in a higher FDA regulatory category? So, so currently we have, you know, we're not diagnosing anybody for the current app that's publicly available. We're just giving form feedback. So there's no, um, you know, higher sort of FDA regulation. The physical therapist is the one that diagnoses you and they create the workout routines, um, you know, when you're working with them hands on. And, you know, here's what the provider is able to see. You know, you can see the database. They can look through their patients and customize these routines so that, you know, we don't have to actually prescribe these exercises or diagnose. And all we're doing is empowering them with data. So we have rep accuracy here. You know, we're making sure that the PTs have everything they need so that they can properly diagnose objectively. We right. plan to, we plan to um, diagnose or give routines after our clinical study once we've gathered data about how, how well simple works. Excellent. Well, that is all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Simple. Excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you, you to so the much. judges for all your questions. All Thank right. You. Good job. Excellent startups this morning. Lots of excitement. We are going to move to our next presentation. This is, uh, can I have Oya Femtech Apparel? Come on up. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're going to take a moment to collect our thoughts, let the judges collect their thoughts on the last presentation while you get set up. Thank you. But you are welcome to uh, share your screen when you're ready. Uh, can you see it? I can see it. It looks great. It's uh, full, fully on my screen. So we'll take just a little bit of time. And just a reminder, uh, you will pitch for 10 minutes, and then we will have 10 minutes of question and answer. Uh, question and answer will come in through the question box to me, and I will read the questions to you for 10 minutes. Sounds good. All right, Oya Femtech Apparel, let's go ahead. You have 10 minutes and I will start the clock when you begin. Okay, you can hear me. Good morning, judges. I'm Mitch Gilbert. I'm the CEO of Oya Femtech Apparel. And I'm Ashley, and I'm the Chief Compliance Officer at Oya. Let's start with one question. Do you care about happy, healthy vaginas? Because ladies, Vaginal health is one of the most important things a woman can have. And gentlemen, vaginal health is one of the most important things you can support because I'm sure we can all agree that if the women in your house aren't happy, you're not happy. So if you're like our customers who are looking for convenient ways to avoid the $18 billion US feminine health issues market, then we have a solution for you. OYA launched Feminine Health Leggings just two weeks ago, and we've already generated 10K in revenue with a 10X return on customer acquisition costs. And today, we're pitching through the 600K investment needed to be a million, multi-million dollar business in two years. We're going after the athleisure market with the FinTech Spin because it's a clear, sizable, and growing white space. By 2025, the global athleisure market will total to $520 billion. In 2020, athleisure sales were up 26% since women and men are wearing more athleisure during COVID. And with women continuing to work remotely, athleisure is here to stay. By 2025, FemTech is expected to be a $50 billion industry because women are spending more on health and wellness. And it's not simply that we're spending more, but it's that now is the first time in history that we can buy solutions to health problems we've historically had. For example, let's look at the fatal flaw of the legging industry alone. Our incumbents don't talk about vaginal health, so they make leggings that harm vaginal health. According to the CDC, 75% of women will have feminine health issues in their lifetime. And 30% of women have bacterial vaginosis right now. 30%, that includes the women in this room, sisters, wives, mothers, and daughters, and they're not happy about it. Now, add to that the fact that competitor leggings make women two times more likely to develop vaginal health issues. 
This problem doesn't surprise me as someone who worked at Nike because women are never the focus of the conversation. Even if most women face these issues, it's always about athletic branding, margins, and style, so women just feel invisible. We are here to put a stop to this by being the first to address the legging vaginal health problem with our Femtech leggings. Our first breakthrough comes from our innovative crotch gusset technology. On the left, you can see three mesh panels that enable airflow. On the right, it's an exploded view of our crotch gusset and its removable insert. The top and bottom of the crotch gusset are made of lightweight mesh, so vaginas can breathe comfortably without building up odor or bacteria like our competitors' leggings. The removable pad, which I'm holding here, has multiple layers to promote absorbency and breathability, and the outside is made of the same material as the leggings, so it blends in seamlessly. Plus, it's not only absorbent, but also reusable, which makes vaginas and your wallets happy. To protect our innovations, we're creating a portfolio of utility method and design patents and trademarks. And in fact, we have already filed a provisional utility patent. Our crotch gusset and our removable insert are revolutionary for women who get hot or sore from working out, and who doesn't, or who have gone through childbirth or menopause because they absorb light urinary incontinence, menstrual leaks, and sweat. They have 12 more panels than the average legging. They eliminate the need for underwear, and their removable pads can be refrigerated and used as a vaginal cold pack. Again, our revolutionary leggings provide women freedom. We currently have four SKUs at $85 a legging available in two lengths and five sizes. Our most popular size is small, evidenced by the fact that we sold out of smalls across all four SKUs in just six hours after launching. Our technology has been proven. We are the first OBGYN endorsed legging. This is a huge differentiator because OBGYNs have been with us since the beginning and they have backed us up with science. Secondly, customers have given us an average review of 4.8 out of five stars. And lastly, our legging is five times more breathable and three times more fluid observant than our average competitor. Moreover, our team has the expertise to scale across athleisure and be successful, as this is our CEO's fourth successful company. Up top, my co-founders and I represent brands like Under Armour and Nike, where Mitch, our CEO, worked in apparel operations. This experience gave us insider knowledge of the apparel industry and helped us build a supply chain with profitable SKUs. Below, our advisors represent brands like Nordstrom and Target. Our team's expertise and adaptability was really exhibited last year through our supply chain. We couldn't follow our original plan to manufacture in the US since factories were closed during COVID. Instead, we pivoted in just two months to partner with an overseas full package manufacturer. We had a full production run where oil reduced lead times by 33% and cogs by $21 a legging. And now we're excited to be looking to bring manufacturing back to the US now that it's opening up again. Local production will give OYA increased control to scale quantity, quantity without sacrificing quality. Another example of our team's success is our progress over the past year, from raising 28K in non-dilutive funding to incorporating and filing a provisional utility patent and then launching on March 19th. That's because we are coachable and we do the work. OYA is no longer theory or just an MBA project, and we have the customers, the revenue, the product, and the supply chain to prove it. Current customer solutions fall into two buckets, incontinence products or sportswear leggings. On the incontinence side, most solutions are embarrassing or uncomfortable, like diapers, pads, or surgery, or their underwear, which doesn't address issues with legging breathability. On the sportswear side, there's not many options. Competitors focus on either athletic branding or style and fit, not feminine health. For example, when have you heard Nike mention the word vagina? What about Lululemon? Never and this is an opportunity for OYA. I know you're probably thinking, why wouldn't Nike just copy us? Well, here are five reasons they can't. One, we're advancing the FinTech apparel company, but it's too risque for big brands to venture into alone. Remember, you've never heard a big brand say vagina. This gives us a first mover advantage. Two, I know from Nike that competitors have product lead times of over 18 months, leaving us one year to protect OYA with aggressive scaling and branding. Three, our authenticity drives customer loyalty and network effects. We're the first to talk about these problems openly and create stigma-free solutions. So customers have literally bought OYA for themselves, their moms, and friends. Four, the market is large and highly fragmented. Competitors acquire to gain market share. 
Five, imitation is the purest form of flattery, but Oya's IP ensures that competitor products will not be the same and competitors will have to play catch up because to them, FinTech is a possibility, not a priority. Oya is built on a FinTech innovation focus. Now, some people say that our market is niche, but vaginal health issues are Googled more times than Kim Kardashian. Oya will capture this market with the first mover advantage, differentiated messaging strategy, scaling quickly to drive down costs, network effects, and product proof points. Because historically, feminine health products were not designed by women. So this idea of niche is skewed. There will always be target customers of recent moms, women athletes, and perimenopausal, but they've been invisible. Where are the products that solve their problems? Oya's customers are not being served, so their willingness to pay is high. Short story, Oya's awesome. Quantitatively, Oya generated 10x our customer acquisition costs in two weeks. Qualitatively, customers ask us every day when we were restock, meaning we're ready to scale as soon as we get funding because we have traction and a team that's ready to go get it. Oya's earned 38K in income through revenue in six competitions. Shout out to any Blue Devils, Vardians, Wildcats, Berserklies, and Bruins here, or anyone affiliated with one of our four partners. With Nike's ops experience, we built a supply chain that delivers strong unit economics from launch. With an $85 price point, we're in line with competitors while generating a 60% gross margin. By year three, we'll drive down costs by scaling quickly. We seek 600K to move, one, move manufacturing back to the US. Two, distribute to OBGYNs and influencers for awareness building. Three, do marketing and PR. And four, manufacture more product lines. We'll generate 930K in revenue by year two and 45 million by year five, given the pace of our scaling and the virality of our products. Finally, we're going to win in the market because it's highly fragmented. It's growing and women want happier vajayjays. So Oya's ultimate ask is not the 600K investment, but whether you're willing to invest in solutions that advance women's health. Because we're already paving the way to build this multi-billion dollar global category and support happy, healthy vaginas. Again, we are Oya, I'm Mitch, this is Ashley, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Oya. Great presentation. Uh, we're now going to move to Q&A from the judges who have been putting uh, questions in the Q&A function fast and furiously. Uh, first question, uh, the legging market, how does uh, the seasonability or geography or fashion impact, impact the econ economic stability of the legging market? So what challenges do you foresee uh, to your uh, providing for this market? Uh, one, before we answer that question, I really want to highlight that unlike our competitors, sportswear competitors, our product, product roadmap will not depend on a lot of SKUs and color waves, which a lot of our competitors get trapped into, especially with seasonality, because our differentiator is not high fashion or trendy products. Our products are technical. They serve specific markets of recent moms, perimenopausal women, and athletes. So instead of being trendy or high fashion, our success relies on developing comfortable, convenient solutions like a luxe legging that eats cellulite. To that point, we have incorporated different legging limbs throughout the year, as well as different fabric thicknesses. So for example, a thicker fabric in the winter and a capri or biker short for the summer. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions about manufacturing. Um, would How will profits be reduced with manufacturing moving to the U.S. or uh, why would you produce in the U.S. if it's a higher cost? For U.S. manufacturing, we need four things. One, we need 50K to hire a full-time production manager. Two, 35K to meet local uh, 1,000 MOQ production requirements. And three, to your question, our COGS would increase about $10, about $10 per unit uh, if we produce 1,000 units, but that would be offset by the decreased shipping and fulfillment costs if we produce here. Also, that $10 uh, per unit increase would actually decrease as we scale quantity. 
Um, to the second part of the question, moving manufacturing back to the US gives us more control over uh, quality, um, as well as really helps us with scaling quickly. Thank you. Next question. Uh, some of the problems associated with vaginal health and leggings usage seem to be caused by tightness or use of synthetics or synthetic fibers. Are yours designed differently to, uh, uh, to be less tight or to use natural fibers? Yes. So we've actually partnered with OBGYN since the beginning of, of this process. Actually, OBGYNs were the first to alert us of these problems. Um, so our leggings have been, when we say OBGYN endorsed, our leggings have actually been tested by OBGYNs who agree that the product is very different than competitors and it supports vaginal health. To that point, we've designed with meshes in mind as well as cotton. Uh, cotton is a key component of our pad because it's very breathable and it's supportive to the vagina, um, as well as the fact that this mesh, uh, this the layer that's actually touching the vagina to get very technical is mesh, meaning that it helps draw moisture away. So again, OBGYNs are saying drier and more air the better, and our designs were specifically created to do that. And um, another example of that is the average legging only has four panels, Ours have 16. We were we completely flipped the design of a legging on its head to protect the vagina. Thank you. Next question. What's the total amount of investment required to achieve positive cash flow? Uh, we will be cash flow positive starting year three if we raise 600K. Thank you. And next question. Uh, will you license your technology? So we've spent a lot of time thinking about licensing. Uh, this is not a strategy that we will deploy until years from now once we have an established brand because licensing IP makes it hard to control your brand. That said, we have three pieces of IP that you can see here on the left, including our crotch gusset design and our core product, the removable pad and the Oya brand. Initially, we'll self-manage production and we won't license any IP. As we get bigger, brands will most likely come to us and ask, but we will take those on a case-by-case -case basis further downstream. We suspect that if we license, our biggest opportunities will be one, the right to manufacture Oya pads as they are a reoccurring revenue stream. They only last up to 12 months and we are creating design patents to protect the pads that work best with our leggings. Um, the other opportunity is the right to use Oya trademarks like Disney characters. However, again, our biggest concerns with licensing are around quality control over our license IP and favorable license licensing terms as we are a young startup. Thank you. Um, how did you decide upon your price for the leggings? Uh, would your market be bigger uh, with less, less expensive products? Uh, Oya is a premium legging because of our fabrics alone. Uh, we actually price below our competition because we offer more benefits for less money. For example, this is a $120 Lululemon legging, $100 Lulu legging, and $90 leg Nike legging you see here. And none of these leggings even come with pockets. Whereas our leggings, for example, have three because who can live without pockets? Lastly, on the right, you can, again, you know that 30% of women are suffering from BV right now. It takes $91 and months on average to treat BV. According to our customer, a legging that helps women prevent BV is well worth $85 and less than the cost of their BV treatments anyway. So our price point uh, really reflects the quality uh, as well as the fact as our competitive positioning and the, um, the solutions we can help our customers solve or the problems we can help our customers solve. Thank you. Um, how did, what's your plan to reach your customers? Uh, internet sales, retail shelf space, uh, where are you gonna go uh, to get your leggings out there? Uh, I think those are a couple questions. I'm gonna attack them one, one at a time. Uh, so one, uh, we know that marketing is huge for us because we're consumer. That's why we're being scrappy and strategic. For example, we're a digitally native vertical brand. We started with a launch on our website to expand our D2C presence. Then we're doing a summer Kickstarter because our product has proven that it can go viral and we want that big bump of brand recognition. Then we'll explore strategic retail partnerships. However, given our margins, our core business profit will come from our, the D2C side and any retail partnerships will most likely be for exposure and brand recognition. Um, to that point, 
our digital marketing funnels already outperform industry averages. We have ad click rates that are six to 11 times higher than the industry average, web page bounce rates that are 10 points lower than the industry average, and add to cart rates that are three times higher than the industry average. Our buy rates, which only about like, you know, we just launched on 319, are already on par with industry averages. And this is because this is a topic that no one's talking about and a solution that women want to buy. Also, we're getting really good at guerrilla marketing tactics. Thank you. Got a couple of questions about, uh, I guess I would couch it as competitors. So are there uh, considerations to expand to cover menstruation products or where similar to Thinks or is a brand or product like Thinks one of your biggest competitors? Can you talk about uh, that landscape for a moment? Yes. Our brand is Femtech Apparel, so we're always looking for women for ways to improve women's health across athleisure. Immediate brand extensions include a luxe legging that eats cellulite, different legging lengths, especially for our runners during the summer. Underwear, uh, similar to this question about like things with the menstrual underwear, underwear make a lot of sense for us, for uh, customers who don't necessarily feel comfortable not wearing underwear in their leggings, but they want a different solution. And finally, a replaceable gusset pad pack that includes both absorbent and cooling gusset pads. Uh, after these immediate extensions, we're also looking into more silhouettes like tech fit t-shirts and hats. Um, also on a side note, because this is I'm, I'm, I get excited about this. We're excited about the cooling gusset packs because we learned that recent moms and perimenopausal women put Oya pads in the refrigerator to help with bruising and to cool down. So we're going to make an icy hot pad that can be cooled and uh, warmed without leakage. Thank you. Um, what are your team's plans? And uh, tell us more about your hiring that you're gonna, would like to do. So, Initially, we have three people who are moving. Let me go to the team. So all of our advisors are moving forward with our company. And initially, we have space for three people on the team to come with us. And that's part of the 600K that we are raising as far as salaries. Um, immediate hires uh, include marketing as well as a CFO. And uh, we're really excited to begin uh we're currently interviewing for those roles. And once we're able to raise funding, it will really help with uh, team expansion over the next few years. We anticipate having within the first year about three employees and by year five to grow to about 40 to 50 employees. Thank you. And last question, a few questions. Uh, what is OYA an acronym for? Uh, we are Oya Femtech Pernero, Pernero, Apparel. It's pronounced Oya. We're named after the Yoruba warrior queen who's the goddess of storms and rebirth. Uh, we create technically advanced apparel that focuses on women's health. Um, our story started at the OBGYN's office two years ago where I learned that leggings make women two times more likely to develop health issues. Uh, we then created the first OBGYN endorsed legging to support women's health. Our personality is empowering, active, and youthful, and our brand colors and combine the happiness of yellow, the common properties of blue, and the renewing qualities of green. Uh, we are also women-led, body, and age inclusive. All right. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Oya Femtech Apparel. Thank you for your presentation today. Thank you to the judges for all your questions. And we will move to our next presentation, which is Elephant Medical. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, Elephant Medical. So I can see your screen, it looks great. Awesome. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Can you do another test check one yeah. more time? Still speaking, ready to go? Still speaking, ready to go, all right. <laughs> uh, that sounds great. So we have roughly one minute before start time. Sure. Give everyone just a little breather, collecting their thoughts. And once again, you will have 10 minutes to present. And then I will uh, ask the judges to put questions in the question box and I will read them to you as they come in. Excellent. Get my timer. 
All right, Elephant Medical, I'll start the timer whenever you begin. Great, thank you so much. I wanna start off today by asking a very simple question. How is it that over a year since the onset of the pandemic, we are still unable to purchase a COVID-19 rapid test online or in a local pharmacy? Among a number of other unpleasantries, the pandemic has shown the light on the inadequacies of the current rapid diagnostic market. Here at Elephant Medical, we are reimagining rapid diagnosis and are leveraging advances in machine learning technology in order to provide patients with a digitally integrated testing solution. Of course, when you hear rapid testing technology, the pandemic springs to mind. But today I would like to tell you about a public health crisis that in 2018 produced over two times the number of infections than COVID-19 did last year, and that would greatly benefit from a diagnostic platform such as our own. These are sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, and they've been around quite a bit longer than COVID, but remain a heavily underserved healthcare market across the globe. The increase in prevalence of STIs is what we like to call a silent epidemic, happening right under our noses in communities across the USA and Canada. Now we'll be touching on this later on in the presentation, but there are a number of different STIs out there. So we've decided to focus the attention of our first product on the two diseases that are most easy to diagnose via a simple urine test and that are also curable. In 2018, the CDC reported over 5.6 million cases of big two non-viral STIs, otherwise known as chlamydia and gonorrhea. These diseases are particularly hard to contain as they often go unnoticed. In fact, up to 80% of women who contract them are asymptomatic. This contributes to STI testing uh, being a major burden in, on the US healthcare system, with total direct medical costs in 2018 totaling $16 billion. The reason for this pre the prevalence of these diseases is pretty simple. There's just a lack of testing solutions available to the public outside of the doctor's office. Based on the sexually active adult demographic, the CDC recommends 148 million STI screenings every year in the US alone, but only actually records 25 million. When surveyed, 80% of Americans cited both privacy and convenience as major barriers to getting tested for STIs. Thankfully, some options are becoming available that allow patients to get tested for chlamydia and gonorrhea in the comfort of their own homes. Companies such as Let's Get Checked and Texas's very own Everlywell make $100 million plus in revenue annually through send-in testing services, with the latter having recently been valued at $1.3 billion. In their business model, patients order a kit online, a urine or swab sample is collected, returned to their testing facilities, and they're communicated the result by phone a few days later. And that's all well and good, but wouldn't it be wonderful if instead the results could be communicated in a matter of minutes without having to send your private biological data to a remote testing center? Elephant Medical is accomplishing exactly that with our flagship product, the Compact. This digitally integrated rapid diagnostic solution for the detection of big two STIs combines proprietary biorecognition technology with state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms to provide our patients with convenient, reliable, inexpensive, and private testing in the comfort of their own homes. We've accomplished this by digitizing the widely adopted lateral flow assay, a cornerstone of the rapid diagnostic market used for everything from pregnancy to COVID-19. In order to make this a little bit more intuitive, we have included a short demonstration of the tech working in real time. Um, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is a typical lateral flow assay and its traditional output a visible line appearing over time in that small little dotted box that communicates the result to the user. In the graph, you are seeing Elephant Medical's innovation. Within the compact casing, our proprietary electromagnetic sensors transform the traditional visual signal into the, from the very same strip into a rich dynamic data set, which is transmitted to the patient's smartphone via Bluetooth. The advantages of this disposable platform are threefold. First, the test results are automatically and intuitively communicated to the patient on their smart device. Second, we can connect the patients to telemedicine services to deliver end-to-end -end care at the point of need in a way that our send-in competitors simply can't. And lastly, thanks to our embedded sensing technology, we can squeeze so much more out of the lateral flow assay that the compact already today has a five times better limit of detection than traditional tests. In order to lock down this intellectual property, we've also curated a solid legal support team. Our patent attorneys are helping us secure three channels of IP, including specific patents in the realms of biology, signal digitization, and our methods for both digital care and data interpretation. Provisional patent applications in all of these areas are either filed or being filed, and we are currently optimizing our systems with the goal of producing high quality patents based on these provisionals. One more important note that I can sprinkle in here is that despite a really great amount of support coming from the McGill University community, we have received a full IP release from them and therefore are not beholden to its IP policies. As for timeline, Elephant incorporated federally in Canada in early 2019. Since then, we've been working diligently to develop the benchtop proof of concept you saw two slides ago. With this milestone achieved, in the short term, Elephant is seeking a seed round to finalize development and manufacture infrastructure for our first gen prototype. V1 of the compact will then be used in a pilot study with patient sourced samples from a partner clinic in Montreal called Prelib, 
who are responsible for over a thousand STI tests a month and are eager to work with us uh, on product development. In the longer term, Elephant must obtain regulatory approval from the FDA and other agencies prior to marketing and distributing the compact. Our regulatory consultants have helped us develop a strategy uh, involving the implementation of QMS procedures for eventual ISO 13485 certification, a clinical trial into demonstrating substantial equivalence under the class 2 510K pathway, and ultimately approval under the LJC and LIR product codes, which are specific to chlamydia and gonorrhea rapid tests. And so now that we've talked tech, let's discuss how this idea is gonna make some money. In the short term, our commercialization strategy will be to sell the compact through online distribution channels in order to generate market traction and eventually be able to sell in, star, in store, either over the counter or on the shelf. As for who is going to make the device, to that end, Elephant has developed a relationship with the most prominent lateral flow manufacturer in Canada, International Point of Care, whose GMP and ISO 13485 manufacturing facilities have expressed interest in partnering with us to bring the compact to market. If we look a little bit deeper into those numbers, our current projections state that at a ramp of 1 million units per year, our COGS should be on the order of $10 per device. At an estimated price point of $40, our gross profit margin would be 75%, significantly higher than the McKinsey reported industry average of 59. If we compare this value to the current price of send-in chlamydia and gonorrhea tests, uh, such as those from Everly Well and Let's Get Checked, even at that margin, the compact would still be 20% less expensive than the cheapest send-in service. And this is why we believe uh, that our solution will be a profitable one, especially given the added convenience for users who will no longer have to wait days for the same test result. As for the purchases themselves, Elephant will follow the same model used by other send-in testing companies, accepting payments on our website and providing our patrons with downloadable reimbursement forms in order for them to claim the tests under their respective insurance programs or through their HSAs or FSAs. Upon having generated this traction and recognition in the market, our longer term commercialization strategy is to partner with telemedicine companies because the compact will provide them with the tools necessary to cater from patients for diagnosis all the way through treatment via virtual prescriptions. Our strategies are beginning to receive validation from the market even at this early stage, especially from telemedicine providers who are excited to get their hands on the compact. Dialog, for example, is Canada's largest telehealth company who funny enough just IPO last week uh, and they validated our product concept in a letter of support saying that we currently refer patients to local screening clinics before prescribing appropriate treatments. The compact will enable Dialog to deliver all-in-one STI testing and treatment solutions at the point of need while mitigating the stigma commonly associated with these services. We envision that our platform's integration with medical devices as an essential next step in our holistic approach to virtual care. As far as traction goes, Elephant uh, has been able to raise around $300,000 from private investors and public supporters including the Canadian federal government, the Quebec provincial government, and some of the most well-renowned accelerators and incubators in the Montreal area. And now a little bit more about the team behind this idea. Uh, Elephant Medical is born of the Department of Bioengineering at McGill University. And though all four co-founders have diverse areas of expertise, we are lucky enough to all share the title of bioengineer. We're also proud to say that we've surrounded ourselves with a top class group of employees, advisors, and mentors. Among them are individuals such as Mr. Steve Arless, founder and CEO of Cryocath, a medical device company acquired by Medtronic in 2008, and Mr. Stuart Koslick, former CEO of Puzzle Medical Devices, whose technology recently received breakthrough device designation with the FDA. I'll also say in this section that we're incredibly grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today. And while we've had great success in attracting advisors in Canada, we are actively looking for American partners to help champion our product in the USA. On that note, Elephant is currently seeking a $2 million seed round in order to take our technology closer to market. This investment would be distributed across four main areas, R&D to optimize the compact further and conduct our pilot study, operations in order to hire more talent and implement QMS procedures, legal to protect our intellectual property as it solidifies and regulatory affairs because we all know how important those are for medical devices. I wanna thank you all so much for listening to me today. And if I may leave you with the final bit of food for thought. In 2018, according to the CDC, one in five Americans had a sexually transmitted infection. In fact, if you combine the number of cases from the seven most prominent STIs, there were a total of 68 million new or existing infections in the US that year alone, over double the number of COVID-19 infections recorded as of this week. We talked a lot about chlamydia and gonorrhea today, but I wanna take the time to reiterate the most exciting part of Elephant Medical's vision. The compact is before anything else a platform a target agnostic tool which can be outfit to detect any biomarker or any infection, be it sexually transmitted or not. This opens the door for our technology not only to service the expansive diagnostic market for STIs, but also provide a 21st century solution to the inadequacies of the current rapid test landscape, made oh so obvious by the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elephant Medical. 
I will now turn to some judges' questions uh, to read to you. Uh, first question, what is the utility of the real-time kinetic information for a binary positive-negative test? Yeah, I think, uh, hi everyone, this is Michael from Elephant Medical. Um, so the real benefit that we've alluded to in the graph and a lot of the other uh, wording that we've chosen in this presentation is that um, by changing the data from like a very simple yes, no color that people read with their eyes to this extended dynamic signal that you can see here, and there's actually like 30,000 individual points that are being sampled in this test on this uh, image in real time right now. Um, we enable the ability to use the best in class machine learning and deep learning algorithms to classify that yes or no diagnosis with a much better um, accuracy and much more information that's available to the classification than just taking the traditional static signal. Thank you. Next question, can you speak to your validation and accuracy of your test? Uh, how long large is your testing was your testing population? Yeah, I can uh, jump in there. Adam from Alpha Medical here. And so like we mentioned in, in the, uh, the presentation, uh, we're looking forward to, to partnering with a Montreal-based uh, STI clinic to conduct our first pilot study. To date, we have actually validated the compact in a benchtop setting. And like we said in the presentation, we've been able to achieve um, a five times better limit of detection over the traditional test, which use a visual uh, results readout. And so to that effect, um, we're looking forward to being able to test with clinical samples, um, but haven't to date. Thank you. Um, can you discuss the sensitivity and specificity of your existing product? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and again, this, this comes back to the, to the idea that um, based on our regulatory pathway, um, we're looking to complete that um, pilot study first off and move towards a, a clinical study um, next year where we'll be able to, uh, again, work with the, the population sample and the clinical samples necessary in order to um, you know, validate these results um, and, and calculate those sensitivities and specificities for our device. Thank you. Um, next question, what do you expect will prove to be the most valuable and defensible IP? The biorecognition molecules, the biosensing technique, or the AI interpretation? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I think that it's going to be uh, a combination of those things. We are looking to patent families of ideas to start with and then kind of funneling down into more specific things later on. Um, I think the most valuable thing uh, that we've done is by converting it to a digital signal and applying machine learning to a purely, uh, usually just a purely physical process. I think that that in and of itself from our research has never been done before. So that is probably the strongest. It's going to be the application of the algorithms that we've designed to uh, lateral flow, which nobody really, it's hard to make that connection at the beginning anyways. Um, but yeah, I'd say that would probably be the, the most, the strongest part of our platform's IP. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, talk about your price point again, and how will this be received by insurance companies uh, in the US or in Canada? And do you have any insights into that? Yeah, absolutely. So for the uh, price points, the first thing we did was a um, price sensitivity analysis. We spoke to a lot of different potential or current people, you know, experiencing STI testing. And so we wanted to make sure first and foremost that we fell, that our price point of $40 per unit fell within the price sensitivity range to readily be adopted by people that were willing to pay out of pocket for this service. I will also say that we're less expensive than every single other competitor on the market um, by the, the cheapest that we found. And this is like cheaper than all the others too, is $50 and we're pricing at $40. So even at a margin of 75%, which is healthily above the industry average, we still have a lot of room to play with our price point to get more competitive, to get uh, pricier, to, you know, to generate more profit. So I'll say that our pricing strategy is a huge benefit um, of the compact right now. And then secondly, in terms of reimbursement and payer payee systems, uh, we have had extensive discuss discussions with uh, experts and, and consultants in the area. And the big thing that is, that is helping us and enabling us in that area is that our COGS are lower than the current technologies that are being used. So for payer payee systems, they get offered a technology that solves the problem in a better way than existing services because we're reducing the number of complications from STIs. And we do so at a lower price point than the existing service. So it, it, you know, it's, it's like a de facto uh, solution that we're cheaper and we resolve the problem earlier than the competitors. So that's where we think the payer payee, payer payee systems will really like um, Elephant's product. 
Thank you. Uh, next question. With 860,000 required for R&D, how much do you have completed to date and uh, or how much do you have still to go? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, I think that our product, basically what, what we're um, still trying to accomplish is the how I like to interpret this is um, we've proven the concept, we've made our first prototype, we have our first results that are better than the industry average, right? That five times number that I was saying during the presentation. Now, the rest of that money is going to go to two things. It's going to go to the optimization. So that's really in, in the where we are right now in that phase of optimization of the compact in with the vision of that pilot study later this year. And the other side of that is just hiring better people with more talent and skill that are able to bring their expertise, not only in the bio side, which is like where we started, um, but the engineering side, the uh, even the machine learning and software development side. So I think a lot of that R&D money is just going, going to be putting together a really great team to help this across the finish line. But the nice thing is we're not starting from nowhere. We're starting with a prototype that has proven track record of being better. Um, and now we're just ready to, to take off as this kind of investment. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions on uh, the device. What is the shelf life of the testing strip and does it work with all mobile operating systems? And then another question was, uh, how does someone actually use the device? How does the biological sample get into the device, into or onto the device? Okay, sure. Um, so I'll answer the, uh, sorry, could you repeat the first question? I, I just missed that. Yes, I asked too many at once, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is the shelf life of the testing oh, the strip? And yes, how much does it, uh, how does it work with mobile operating systems? Uh, the shelf life, it'll be perfectly comparable to any other type of lateral flow assay. Uh, we are actually playing with uh, no our novel biorecognition technology is um, nucleic acid based, which would give it maybe a longer, but I would say minimum a year uh, of shelf life, no problem. Um, the second question, I believe it was how the user will be using the device. Um, that's a, an interesting question as well, because uh, a lot of the times any previous companies who have tried to create this device have, uh, aside from the sensitivity issues, uh, it's a it's like opening a chemistry kit you know uh, and they're only intended for lab use and un, uh, and trained skilled end users what the nice thing is with this technology is that what we're, what we're envisioning is that a person would be able to correct collect a urine sample into like a cup for example and then basically all you would have to do is take the compact and click it in and this and that basically would allow the, the sample to flow it would cross our our sensing technology and it's a simple like collect click and then read the results on your phone you don't have to strain your eyes to see if it's like a positive or negative none of that so that's the user experience that we see right now thank you uh next question COVID 19 has drawn forth many new point of care diagnostics now that are now emerging what do you think of the uh potentially newly emerging competitors like Luminostics, Elum, Binax, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great point. Um, and, and especially with respect to Elum, um, they just received a $200 million plus deal with the, the American government uh, to deliver their at-home uh, testing solution for COVID-19. Uh, and, and, you know, really with their product, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a great comparison because they are able to take um, test results from a lateral flow device and connect them directly to, to a smartphone. We see this as a huge point of validation for what we are trying to deliver to the market of STIs. And we also, based on our research of Alum, uh, understand that our electromagnetic sensing technology offers actually advantages in the long, long term from a technological perspective, uh, where we'll actually be able to uh, reduce the cogs of our device even further and actually achieve greater sensitivities than an optical-based sensing that they're using right now. And so again, uh, it's a great validation and we're, and we're on, on track to be doing better. I think you might be on mute. Sorry, no, no, hello. <laughs> Next question, how are your, will your, will your product be distributed? Uh, are we talking mail, are we talking pharmacy, grocery? Um, and since you're providing a diag diagnosis, how will your system connect with physicians or clinicians uh, for, that, may approve, that may provide FDA uh, or approved treatment. Right, yeah, me... so I think there's there's a, a few different ways, a few different areas to unpack there. 
Uh, first and foremost, I think powering the back end of our service is really telemedicine and the connection to clinical services that are really like exploding over the last year. Like we, we saw Dialogue IPO and are now valued at a billion dollars. Two years ago, they were still considered a startup. And so aside from the technology and the first clinical experience that we're bringing into the user's home, we're integrating with these telemedicine services such that they can provide the second half of that whole treatment process, which is consulting with a medical practitioner, receiving a prescription if necessary, and then, you know, being advised on future practice, how to avoid the situation. And so that's the first major thing that our treatment includes that as part of the back end, And we're looking to partner with telemedicine companies on that end. Um, so in terms of distribution channels, on a similar note, telemedicine is a huge distribution channel and they get requests every day in the thousands for, oh my, I'm, I have this terrible or extremely inconvenient symptom, um, how can I resolve this? And right now they don't have a way to do that. So telemedicine is a huge way to distribute um, our, our product. Finally, of course, we do want to make this as convenient for as many people as possible. And so getting into pharmacies and being able to be purchased right off the shelf is our end objective for the compact. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Elephant Medical. Great presentation. Thank you to the judges for all of your questions. We're now going to take a six minute break. Let you stretch your legs. Uh, so we will take a little break and we'll be playing a video from the Greater Houston Partnership about Houston, Texas, and we encourage you to watch that and we will play that in roughly two minutes. So definitely be back here for our next pitch at 1047, but stick around for the video on from the Greater Houston Partnership in two minutes. The purpose of the Accelerator is to support the growth of clean energy startups with innovative technology solutions. The Rice Alliance Clean Energy Accelerator will be a hands-on 12-week program to support startups from across the U.S. and from around the world. These startups will have access to the Rice Alliance's network of energy corporations, investors, and advisors. The startups will have the benefit of making connections with energy experts who can provide them advice and who can help them pilot their technologies. Stars will go through an intense curriculum and a programming designed to increase their likelihood of success and accelerate their path forward. This new Clean Energy Accelerator would not have been possible without the generous support from our founding sponsor, Wells Fargo. We're grateful for their vision and their desire to make a positive impact on Houston. Thank you to all of our industry and community supporters as we work together to transform the future of energy. 
we look forward to welcoming our first cohort at the ION after it opens in 2021. I'd like to ask Fibercoat, our next presenter, to please share their screen. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good Thanks morning. for having me. Oh, perfect. I see your screen. And you're both presenting from one, one box. Excellent. All right, so our next presentation is by Fibercoat. This is our fifth startup to pitch here at the RBPC finals. So Fibercoat, you will have 10 minutes of presentation and then I will uh, we'll have 10 minutes of question and answer. I will uh, take the judge questions from the question function and ask them to you. Uh, as a reminder to the startups, you do not need to answer questions in the question function. Please uh, focus on the questions that I will ask you uh, directly, verbally from the Q and A from the Q and A box. Let's see. All right, Fibercoat, your 10 minute pitch will begin. I will start the clock whenever you are ready. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. I'm Alex, Chief Innovation Officer of Fibercoat. With me is my co-founder and CTO, Richard. We are both PhD students focused on physics and mechanical engineering at Germany's largest and best known technical university, the MIT of Germany. Our goal, making high performance material affordable for all to protect us from a permanent and invisible electromagnetic radiation that can threaten the way we live our daily lives. Medical devices need shielding. MRI machines are very sensitive to electric ma magnetic radiation and the rooms that house them must be shielded. Batteries in electric vehicles need shielding as well. With the advent of 5G, even your Alexa will need shielding. And the International Space Station needs to be shielded from all kinds of nasty stuff. Our target market is around $100 billion, probably the largest market you have never heard of. Certainly, all those applications are already using a high-performance shielding material. So why do we need fiber code? My co-founder Richard will offer you a closer look. In today's market, metal fiber fabrics are made of steel, copper, or aluminum. These metal fibers are very expensive with the price of $1,000 per pound. Therefore, they are only used in high-end applications. But why are those materials so expensive? After all, the material itself is cheap, just a couple of dollars per pound. The high cost is due to the very complex production process, containing five to 10 process steps, running at a low speed of 0.4 miles per hour, and a very high energy consumption of 20 kilowatt hours per pound. And then there is the fiber code way. We replace the complex, slow and energy intensive process with our novel and disruptive approach, a one step fiber coating process. Patent protected in Germany, Europe and the US. All patents are owned by fiber code. And here's what we are doing. Our production process is a super fast fiber spinning process and where we coat the fibers with a metal. Our fiber is produced at a speed of 56 miles per hour. 
Let's have a closer look into the process. We provide the liquid metal coating bath device at a cost of $25,000. The factory will provide the melting platinum rhodium bath per patented design. Fibercoat is actually producing the material on industrial scale spinning lines today. In our process, basalt rocks are molten at a temperature of, 20, uh, of 2,400 degrees to form a lava. That lava flows through tiny holes to create a thin fiber. Fiber coat is adding his secret coating device, blurred in the video, to the spinning line, which allows us to coat each individual fiber coming from the melt and is eventually wound on a bobbin. How do we stack up against our competition? Our material is more than one tenth the price. The cost is low because nine out of 10 processes are eliminated. The process is 140 times faster and one tenth of the energy is consumed. And this is how our material, how our fiber looks like. An affordable metal fiber for mass applications. And we are shipping it to our customers today. As a startup, we are laser focused on a few applications, the low hanging fruit. Our first use case in civil engineering application is the shielding of hospitals. Do you remember the problem of the MRI rooms Alex presented in the beginning? Our new material can be applied as a wallpaper to retrofit rooms or whole buildings. Currently MRIs are set up in specially shielded rooms where heavy metal sheets are inserted into the walls during the construction. Low hanging fruit for fiber coat and a $75 billion market in the shielding of buildings. Another use case is the shielding of the battery cases in electric cars. Today, expensive metal foils are used, which are complex to process and prone to damage. The automotive industry is in a dire need for a low cost alternative, which our flexible shielding material provides, while saving bridges weight a $6.5 billion market opportunity. We are entering a new world of increased radiation from 5G. A doctor from Vienna called me last fall complaining that his medical scanning devices were not working properly because a 5G antenna was installed close to his house. Fibercoat came to rescue. We wrapped his device with our material and it runs perfectly now. Fiber coat material is highly flexible, so it can be easily shaped around electronic devices. And remember, Alex telling you about the use in space, when NASA calls, we will be ready. Our material could protect the future moon based from radiation or meteorite impact. In fact, even manufacture our fibers on the moon itself from moon rocks. Back to Earth. We are running 30 pilot projects in different applications today with a conservative revenue potential of $150 million per year. We intend to operate internationally. In fact, we are already operate in over half a dozen countries. We will rent underutilized factories all over the world. Setting up a greenfield basalt fiber spinning factory costs 200 million. That's expensive and beyond the wherewithal of a startup. Our solution entails installing our device in existing plants and renting the underutilized capacity. It costs us $25,000 per spinning line, extremely low capex and production on demand. There are 70 factories around the world representing 7,000 underutilized spinning lines. In 2014, we started our first research trials. With the help of $5.9 million in non-dilutive grants from the German government, over a period of five years, we built this technology. And then we officially launched Fibercode in 2019. We are already operating in a plant in Germany and are working to increase our capacity. We are looking to raise $4.5 million in non, uh, for our current uh, Series A round, of which a non-dilutive $3 million has already been committed by the German government. We have $1.5 million left in this round. 
By 2023, we expect to raise a Series B round of $7.5 million to expand further into global markets. While we build the best company possible without distractions, there will be several ex exit options for our investors over time, IPO, merger or acquisition. Of the 4.5 million Series A investment, we will use almost 60% of it for eight melting bath prototypes. We intend to grow our staff to keep pace with the accepted, expected growth of the business, primarily engineers and technicians, allocating almost 20% of the investment for this purpose. And around 15% of the investment would be used for marketing and sales. This will get us to a production capacity of 125 tons per month. Our business model is quite simple. We rent unused capacity from existing factories and produce fibers from our patented device. Our total cost of production, including labor, raw material, energy, and depreciation, starting at $10 per pound, declining to $8 per pound over time, enabling us to sell our fibers at a market disruptive $18 to $50 per pound, depending on the application. We have a healthy order book for 2021 with $3.5 million, a safe estimate. Because our business is extremely scalable and the market is huge, $100 billion, there is an opportunity to significantly disrupt this market and achieve extraordinary sales close to $200 million 2025. The three founders are Richard, myself, and Robert, the CEO, whose English is actually much better than ours. Together, we have more than 25 years of combined experience. Government grants and revenues from pilot projects have enabled us to hire employees, and we are supported by a strong and diverse board of advisors. After all, the RPC is all about selecting the most investable companies. We at Fibercode are targeting a 40x return for our investors in about five years. To do so, we have to execute into four areas, scaling up, market acceptance, logistics for global manufacturing, and the supply chain. We hope you feel safer now, knowing that Fibercode will be out there protecting you. Please join us in this exciting journey. Thank you. Thank you, Fibercode. Thank you for your presentation. Great job. I'm now going to go to the Q&A box and start asking questions from the judges. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for that. Uh, the first question is, uh, how does the weight of your product compare to your competitors? So uh, thank you for this question. Um, actually, the weight of our material is, is much lower than from our competitors because we are coating fibers with metals. And if you have a pure metal fiber, um, um, the, the core material is even um, it, it, it's the weight of, of metal, right? And our core material is basalt, which is um, four times lower the uh, density. Thank you. Uh, next question. As an OEM to fiber, how, is protect, how are you protecting your IP against other coding companies? Yeah, a good question. Uh, we will open a backup slide for this. So, um, um, our, um, our IP is based on, um, on the material itself. Richard uh, has shown you the fiber, right? The fiber material. Um, and um, this fiber can be produced in different ways and, uh, with different processes. And uh, we want to be sure that this kind of fiber um, is only um, sold by fiber code. And that's why our, material, uh, our, our patent is material based. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next question: Do you uh, are you uh, are you or do you plan to be a German or U.S. legal entity? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, so um, we um, um, uh, we had this question before and discussed it internally. And it, from our perspective, um, it would be really um, um, it would be a, a great idea to fund a um, C corp in the U.S. 100% um, owned by Fibercode. And uh, if there's an investor from, um, um, perhaps an investor uh, who would take the one, uh, entire 1.5 million Series A round, right? Um, we have heard about um, other companies, uh, German GAP companies who did this exactly um, the same uh, before. And uh, we would transfer all of our patents and technology to this C-Corp in the US. Thank you. 
Uh, can you please elaborate on your sales and marketing strategy? Uh, would your product be sold through distribution or direct to end users? In the beginning, we started with uh, 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 creating visibility of our material by um, showing the results of our <clears throat> by showing the, the the result of our pilots, and the feedback was very good on this. So we presented it, for example, in magazines, or we had a webinar on this. In the future, we are planning to hire um, a team of sales guys who can, who can cover that, that job. Uh, it's very important to know here that the deals we make are really huge. So in the range of one to 10 million per deal. So we need a small, strong team of sales guys. Okay, thank you. That answered my next question about hires in the next 12 months. Uh, next one. Um, we, can, we can talk about this as well. All right, you're, who are you hiring in the next 12 months? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah, um, it's very important uh, that we um, do, uh, that we hire sales guys. We have to, uh, we need developers and te technicians, and it's important to have quality insurance guys all over the world. <clears throat> who ensure that also plant in different countries provide uh, a high quality of our material. Um, also, we need a very strong CFO we have to, um, uh, to cover all the uh, finances um, topics in the future. Great. Um, can you tell us more about your pipeline and any revenue you've currently earned? Yeah. Um, so, in um, we sold some of our prototype fibers uh, to interest parties in the third quarter of 2020, and in Q4 we received some R&D contracts from a prospective customer. So uh, it was uh, around about uh, um, 400,000 uh, US dollar in 2021. And uh, we can also uh, show you again our um, um, pilot customers. So we have uh, 30 pilot projects with different customers all over the world. Um, and all of them have uh, a, a huge potential for fiber code. It's mostly in, in the area of automotive industry and of uh, construction area. Thank you. And next question, if there's damage, uh, like uh, if there's damage in coding, such as scratching, how is performance affected and how do you repair it? That's a big advantage of fiber coat material, honestly, uh, because it's a multi-filament yarn, we call it. So it consists of um, like a hundred tiny uh, single fibers. And for example, one or two of them, or let's say 10 of them break, the other fibers will, um, will, will, will make the job and, and take over the... Um, so the function of the product is still there. This is an advantage in compared to, for example, a metal folly, uh, which uh, in case of damage, you create an antenna and the opposite effect happens. Thank you. Uh, this may be related, but durability, how long will shielding last as compared to competitors? There will be no difference in that area because it's honestly, it's, it's, uh, also the, the same aluminum um, we, we use for, for, for the shielding um, as you use, for example, for um, a folly, which is a competitive product. Thank you. Next question. Are you looking to locate inside existing manufacturing plants uh, as a part of the various step in fabrication processes? Okay, can you repeat the question, please? Right. So do you, do you expect or do you want to uh, locate or have your work inside existing manufacturing plants? Yes, we are already producing our fibers today. That means while we are talking in Germany, in our uh, partners, uh, there is a partner who is producing the fiber today. He's actually spinning the fibers today and we go there regularly to, con uh, to control the processes, uh, to, to develop um, new um, um, materials, so for example, to adapt the product to specific needs of customers, for example. Um, that, is, that is also part of the, the business model, that we have our coating device, go to the partner, install it over there, train the stuff, um, and then he 
produces the fibers. To add to this, um, we are uh, also there to convince ourselves of the quality of our uh, produced fibers. Thank you. Uh, next question. How can you guarantee quality standards of your product, which will be manufactured by multiple not owned spinning mills? So uh, we, we, we tried to actually we tried to answer this question uh, in, in the answer before. Um, uh, we, um, we are hiring um, um, also quality uh, uh, um, staff uh, to um, to drive from from um, man fiber manufacturer to fiber manufacturer and to control the, um, the, the the process and also the material which comes out of the of the spinning plant. Beside that, we uh, we uh, we train the people on the machine. Um, to uh, so so that uh, so that they can learn, and we plan to have regular audits um, to um, uh, follow the, the standards and all that stuff, and uh, guarantee high quality of our material. Thank you. Uh, next question: um, Is there any performance criteria in terms of EMI signal strength that your that your coding costing protects against? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question myself. So, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we, we, we try to answer. <laughs> we try to answer for you the question you don't understand. Um, so um, if you want to, for example, if you want to shield um, your battery in your Tesla, you need a shielding of at least 50 decibel um, that DB, that's the unit um, um, actually. And our material is in the range of, um, exactly in the range of what um, the car manufacturer needs to shield his bat battery. And we can even adapt our material. So we have a very thin material, for example, when we produce a fabric, and then we can stack it to exactly meet the range of 50 to 80 DB, which is required in that area. If you look at the graph on the left side, um, you have the shielding effectiveness in DB, uh, on the left and on the bottom you have the frequency. The blue one is the reference of a metal plate and the yellow one is our material. And uh, you can see that our first prototype is already performing in a range of 50 d dB. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, that is all the time we have for a Q&A. Thank you to Fiber Coach for your presentation. Thank you to your judges for the, your questions. Thank you very much for having Thank us. You. Thanks for your time. Thank you. All right. We'll have a uh, little bit of a breather while we get our next startup to present. Our next startup is Candlelytics. There they are. Welcome, Candlelytics. Hi, Catherine. Can we go ahead and share our screen? Please do. Let us test it out. All right, I can see it, looks good. All right, so Candlelytics, you'll have 10 minutes to present and then to follow uh, 10 minutes with the judges. Uh, I will read the judges' questions in the question box. Uh, you don't need to answer them yourselves in the Q&A uh, function. I will simply read them to you. So uh, we are ready to begin and I'll start the clock when you start. Great, thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the 3D revolution is upon us. We're Candlelytics and we're a LiDAR 3D analytics startup building the digital tools that will harness the power of this increasingly ubiquitous 3D data. To illustrate just one example of what this means, I want you to imagine that you're now a member of a US Coast Guard boarding team and your job is to board a suspected smuggling ship to figure out where drugs, weapons, or victims of human trafficking may be hidden. And here's what your current workflow looks like. After boarding the vessel, you must painstakingly measure every interior compartment of that ship. Then you're required to hand sketch that ship's floor plan and then manually calculate volumetrics to identify structural anomalies that could represent potential smuggling compartments. This process can take days. And do you wanna know what tools you have at your disposal? A tape measure, pen and paper. After four backbreaking days, imagine now being told that your team has run out of time. Your authorization has expired and these potential smugglers will be released even though intelligence indicates there's an 85% chance they're hiding something. 
All too often, these are the disappointing results for our Coast Guardsmen. And make no mistake, this is a billion dollar problem. $65 billion to be exact. That's the value of illegal substances that flow into the US, US every year from the maritime domain. And despite being the best resource maritime law enforcement entity in the world, the Coast Guard shockingly fails to stop 91% of all illegally trafficked substances. This is the Coast Guard's most important KPI. It's what's reported to Congress and they are failing. What's worse, the Coast Guard actually has actionable intelligence on 85% of this smuggling activity, but they're unable to interdict three out of every four suspected smuggling ships because their current method of finding contraband is primitive, slow, and ineffective. But it doesn't have to be this way. LiDAR is a technology that uses millions of laser pulses to measure space and capture 3D data, rapidly digitizing the physical world. Advancements in commercial off-the-shelf LiDAR hardware mean that sensors like this handheld scanner are more accessible than ever before. Candalytics is a hardware agnostic 3D analytics software platform that integrates with any scanner and optimizes the time required to go from 3D scan to actionable insight. With Candalytics, LiDAR scanning would allow Coast Guard operators to fully account for space on a suspected smuggling ship in exponentially less time than traditional methods. This 3D data leads to faster actionable insights and comprehensive deliverables that can be easily visualized digitally analyzed and readily shared. These capabilities include fully immersive 3D visualization, the generation of 3D and 2D reference schematics and powerful change detection. So let's take a look at Candalytics in action. What you're about to see is a 200 foot vessel that would normally take the Coast Guard several days to fully account for. With Candalytics, just two hours. This puts a full 3D data tool set at the operator's disposal including the ability to take cross sections and establish exceptional spatial awareness. This comprehensive visualization enables intuitive identification of suspicious voids that could represent smuggling compartments. Here we see a hole in our data. You can see there's no floor in that compartment and you're able to see all the way down to a hole. This is a void and this is exactly what boarding teams are looking for during their search. Again, there's no more need for measuring tape because taking distance, area, and volume measurements is as simple as a click and can be done directly on the model because literally every point in this model is a measurement in 3D space. These types of design schematics that used to take an operator days to sketch by hand can now be generated with a click of a button, providing lightweight engineering grade documentation that can be quickly shared with key stakeholders and incorporated directly into the Coast Guard's existing workflow. This data opens up a whole new world of analytical possibilities. By leveraging scans of the same or similar ships, we can compare what a vessel would look like with what it actually looks like to further detect anomalies. Then by overlaying those scans, we can create an intelligent differential lit up in Christmas lights. And we can detect changes as nuanced here as the movement of a conference table just a few feet, or as you'll see here, changes as nefarious as adding partitions that could be smuggling compartments. And we can show you what this differential looks like in full 3D because that's exactly what we did during our demo with the Coast Guard in San Diego. This is a Coast Guard cutter we scanned in less than 20 minutes. We scanned it twice, once accessing all compartments and the second time creating synthetic voids by closing off areas of the ship. After running our differential analysis, we could immediately highlight areas in the bow and stern seen here in red that were not accounted for and could serve as potential smuggling compartments. This has been a quick preview, but I hope that it's given you a glimpse into the power of Candalytics to harness 3D data and deliver our threefold end-to-end -end solution. And that's a solution that seamlessly integrates 3D collection, analytics, and data management. First, by optimizing mobile LiDAR scanners and putting them into the hands of operators, a vessel can now be scanned as quickly as operators can walk the decks, creating fully immersive 3D models in minutes to hours, not days. Second, Candalytics software will automate 3D and analytics rapidly and intelligently pointing, pointing the Coast Guard to the most suspicious areas on a suspected ship to investigate. Third, Candalytics will take these insights and build a 3D data repository so that knowledge and best practices can be shared across the fleet and enhance the power of machine learning. But what does all this mean for the Coast Guard? In short, increased efficiency and greater operational effectiveness. Candalytics will reduce measurement collection time during Coast Guard boardings by 95%. These time savings are analogous to annual personnel and operational cost savings of almost $400 million. Most importantly, this will result in an additional 1.3 billion in drugs interdicted, the equivalent of deploying five additional Coast Guard cutters year round. We're currently in phase two of product development, taking the prototype we've already demonstrated 
and transitioning it into a testable MVP for fielding in an operational evaluation. This will allow us to get important operator feedback on user experience and ruggedization, and in parallel, we'll begin laying the groundwork to integrate our solution with the data architecture required to establish our 3D data repository. As fielding of our solution scales, this data flow gives us the foundation for training and integrating machine learning algorithms, as well as developing even more advanced 3D analytics. As an end-to-end -end solutions provider, Candalytics benefits from multiple revenue streams, SaaS subscriptions for our software, maintenance contracts for our data management services, and hardware leases as a value-added reseller. Moreover, partnering with the Coast Guard unlocks another incredible source of value, access to data. The Coast Guard conducts nearly 5,000 boardings every year and has a doctoral requirement to document each of these operations. At scale, this means that Candalytics will have access to the largest 3D vessel data set in the world, which will leverage to train industry-leading machine learning algorithms, develop proprietary analytics, and expand from our initial beachhead market. And the Coast Guard is just our first step. We're adopting a land and expand strategy, starting with the maritime drug interdiction market. This alone was estimated to be $1.7 billion in 2020, which was a 27% increase from previous years. This beachhead market positions us to export our end-to-end -end solution to related maritime defense and commercial markets propelled by the growing prevalence of 3D data. And we've already begun this expansion, having made inroads with commercial maritime organizations like the American Bureau of Shipping in Houston, and recently winning multiple government contracts through the Air Force to apply our technology to 3D scanning of airfields. Candalytics is well positioned among competitors. Most LiDAR 3D analytics companies primarily focus on a single industry, and none of these companies are currently addressing the maritime market. Additionally, Candalytics is differentiated by providing an end-to-end -end solution across 3D collection, analytics, and data management, while also tailoring that solution for operators at the tactical point of need. Unlike most LiDAR companies who compete on precision or range, Candalytics trailblazing integration obsessively focuses on minimizing time from scan to insight, creating an optimized solution for the timelines required in the most demanding 3D data use cases. Candalytics is the ideal team with the ideal partners to deliver this transformative solution. We're graduate students, veterans, and engineers from Harvard and MIT with professional experiences in consulting, finance, and technology. Our core team all come from military, defense contracting, or intelligence backgrounds, which means we understand the space, we resonate with these customers, and we've mapped out how to navigate the sales cycle. But most importantly, every member of our team shares a passion for leveraging innovation to benefit national security. As winners of the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Accelerator, we're formally partnered with the Navy's preeminent LIDAR research lab, and we were recently invited to join a Blue Tech Innovation Hub. Over the course of nearly 200 stakeholder interviews, our team has not only developed an intimate understanding of the customer pain point, but also fostered enthusiastic demand for our solution. We've conducted two live demonstrations, briefed senior Coast Guard leadership, and have a formal pilot program this summer. In addition to this traction, Candalytics was recently awarded a small business innovation research contract through the Air Force, as well as a small business technology transfer contract, which we're pursuing in partnership with MIT. We've been invited to speak at this year's Consumer Electronics Showcase, and we're backed by MIT's Innovation Fund, as well as partners from six major venture funds. As we look ahead, Candalytics is starting by addressing a pressing pain point in maritime law enforcement, and then expanding into related commercial and defense markets by building an end-to-end -end platform that harnesses the power of 3D data. But we would love your support. We're seeking angel and pre-seed investments to accelerate us through a critical juncture of product testing, commercialization, and expanding our technical team. And overall, we hope that you'll help empower us to ultimately achieve our vision of making 3D data accessible, intelligent, and impactful. Thank you. And I'd love to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Candalytics. Excellent presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, judges, can you put your questions in the Q&A box and I will start to answer them or read them to Candalytics uh, for our 10 minute Q&A period. So the first question, uh, what volume of space, of space is needed for a smug, smuggling trip to be worthwhile from a smuggler's business standpoint? And how does this compare to your platform's limit of detection? Yeah, I can, I can go ahead and take this one. So um, speaking, let's, speaking with uh, uh, Coast Guard operators, um, a brick of cocaine is roughly 9 to 12 inches by 6 by 3. And so... Um, based on the type of payload that the Coast Guard is interdicting, typically it's going to be around 
93 to 100 cubic feet um, of cocaine that they're looking for. So and, and again, uh, again uh, typ typically quite a large volume that could be spread out again in, in multiple locations on the ship. So it does not have to again be in like one large room. It's typically distributed, for instance, like throughout a wall, throughout a ceiling, throughout a floor. Uh, but that's like the order of magnitude of space that we're looking at. And what we've demonstrated is an accuracy using this system of plus or minus five millimeters. So uh, definitely within the bounds of being able to find a brick of cocaine. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, how does your technology compete or integrate with tech digital twin? Why did you focus on Coast Guard? Uh, what are other, um, other areas, other markets you might focus on? James, do you want to take the first part and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, our expansion? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to like how this compares to digital, to kind of like digital twinning, you know, we, we are, um, that, that can mean kind of multiple things depending on the industry that you're in. So, you know, for instance, for, for some digital twinning initiatives, that looks like creating physics models, right, that, that simulate, uh, you know, oil and gas turbines, for instance, and then you're gaining insights from there. We tend to focus on, right, supporting digital twinning efforts that have to do with uh, spatial data, right? So creating the 3D models that then allow us to, for instance, like tag or trace, um, change detection of a, of a, of a 3D uh, vessel or model over time, Right, and then use like that spatial data to really gain insights into um, things like, in, in this case, right, contraband, but it could also extend to things like maintenance, dry dock, um, repairs, uh, ship deformation or hull deformation over time. So those are just kind of like some areas in which um, this supports a digital twinning effort. And to the second part of that question, Catherine, so uh, we, we definitely see ourselves as pursuing kind of a phased land and expand strategy. And um, the Coast Guard in this case represents a really opportune uh, first landing spot because as an organization, they straddle kind of that government and defense market, but as well as the commercial uh, maritime market. So for instance, uh, you know, based on the, the Air Force contracts that we've won, we're, we're taking the same concept, the same technology and the same use case, just in a different domain to scan uh, airfields for the Air Force. The Coast Guard, in addition to this maritime law enforcement use case, has introduced us to a marine inspection use case. So let's just think of it as the building inspectors of the maritime world, right? And that's how we got in contact with, uh, with uh, companies like the American Bureau of Shipping, right? And, and th they've given us some great ideas of how to adapt this technology very easily to engineering inspection use cases, not only on maritime vessels, but on offshore oil rigs, uh, offshore uh, wind generation turbines. So again, from, from that second tier of market expansion, uh, there's indications that we can take this product into even broader categories, such as going from maritime inspection to, to maritime insurance, or going from you know, scanning airfields to, to uh, you know, oil and gas. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, next question, on the topic of electromagnetic interference, how bulletproof is your LIDAR software from a bad actor that could send out uh, uh, electromagnetic interference signals? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. So, so the, the beauty of, of LIDAR is that it's light-based, right? So um, if, if, you can, if you can see it, then we can detect it. Um, so whereas electromagnetic uh, interference would definitely play a role if uh, we, we were doing um, something in, in, the, in the spectrum of electromagnetics, but because again, this is light, um, you, would, you would need a light source based interference um, mechanism, which would be um, extremely difficult to do when it comes to uh, interfering on a room to room or a ship scale basis, right? You would need, you would need a disruptor in every single space. And so um, again, based on the visual aspect, um, it, it becomes very hard um, to defeat this kind of technology. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions on uh, fundraising. So how much are you raising? How much have you raised to date? Yeah, so our target capital is $500,000 and the deliverable, that mi the milestone that that's connected to is uh, scaling a Coast Guard solution and then uh, posturing ourselves to expand into those uh, related markets that I previously talked about in defense and, and, and maritime. In terms of what we've raised so far, we've got uh, $50,000 in private capital, as well as about $100,000 in non-dilutive funding, 
through grants as well as government contracts. Thank you. Um, uh, what, uh, what end user expertise and training is required and is this a constraint to scaling? That's a, that's a really great question. And, you know, um, what we are optimizing for is not only that speed of scan to insight, but also ease of use at the operator level, right? Because we're not gonna be the ones at that tactical point of need conducting these scans and, and using these analytics. So for instance, the hardware that we've kind of optimized for has one button. It's literally one button optimization. And we're recreating that as we, we're creating that simplicity on the software side. So that operator, all they need to do is scan, visualize, and then make their decisions off of that information. So again, we're optimizing not only for speed, but also in terms of integration with the user workflow and integration with the operator's need in terms of training. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen is that our partner lab has been able to train you know, military reservists, so not full-time employees, to conduct these scans in less than half a day. Thank you. Uh, a few questions on uh, um, information sharing. So will you have exclusive access to the Maritime database or is it a public database? And then uh, another question on, uh, will US government entities share their data with you and will they let you keep it? Yeah, so this is another area where it's really opportune to be working with the Coast Guard, right? So in most kind of defense applications, this data is sensitive because there's national security implications, right? But for the Coast Guard, this data is actually falls on the unclassified side of the house because it's used for law enforcement, right? So as a partner with the, with the Coast Guard moving forward, that gives us access to that data, which allows us not only to build smarter solutions with the Coast Guard, but also increase the smarts of our machine learning algorithms and posturing those to allow us to expand into other markets in a proprietary way. Thank you. Uh, next question, how do you quality check your input data of building, building the data digital twin of the vessel? That yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll take that. So maybe the, way, maybe the way I would answer this is, you know, in terms, of, in terms of the hardware we're using, going kind of back to what Brian said, right? We know, um, we know that the, the hardware is, is spec for a certain level of precision and accuracy. So in our case, uh, we're leveraging hardware that you know has accuracy to win within five millimeters, and I think I think um, when it comes to the the data check, I, I think I would say you know compared to what they're doing now, right? This is orders of magnitude more precise and less prone to human error than anything that they've done uh, done before, right? When you're relying on human made measurements, um, you only have a handful of them, and then there's interpolation involved in kind of piecing together these hand sketches back into kind of an intelligence package there is a lot of room for error. So this again, uh, not only dramatically reduces the time necessary for them to collect that data, but it also produces it um, at, at a level of accuracy and precision and completeness um, that they have never seen before. Thank you. Next question, tell us a little bit more about the strength of your IP and uh, can your software integrate simultaneously generated data from multiple LiDAR devices? Sorry, can you repeat the first part of that question again? Uh, tell us a little bit more about the strength of your IP. Okay, right. So uh, what, I, what I would say here is that we believe that our software optimization is proprietary, especially as it relates to uh, shortcomings or uh, shortcutting some of the traditional um, post-processing steps that are, uh, that are typically involved in creating these models. Um, as, as well as some of the software automations for analysis. So we're optimizing for something very different from competitors where we prioritize time to insight um, and have designed our process and software to deliver those uh, insights as quickly as possible. Um, but what I would also say, and then actually maybe I would add to that, you know, we also are gonna be licensing patents from the Navy, which are relevant to object recognition. Um, but even looking past that, I think, you know, the data that comes out of here where the Coast Guard is scanning 5,000, you know, ships per year, again, gives us a very uh, durable um, um, IP, uh, durable IP here in that we're able to then train those algorithms at a much higher fidelity and accuracy. Um, and then, then kind of going into, I think, the second question, which is, you know, can, can this be captured with multiple LiDAR devices? Yes, there are 
definitely ways in which you can take two distinct um, LiDAR 3D images, combine them into a single model. Um, that does introduce additional processing time, which, you know, if you can, if, if from your mission, if you can um, tolerate that, then we can support that. However, we're also optimizing, again, for a process which allows the Coast Guard to do this in a single pass, right, where an operator is not having to, um, to massage this data into a model, right? We can, we can do, automate that all, all ourselves. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Candalytics, for your presentation. Great job. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to the judges for your questions. And we will now move to, I believe this is our last presentation, AgZen, number seven of the day. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me and see the slides okay? I can and I can, yes. Perfect, so I'll get started. Well, let's, uh, we're gonna take, let's take a breath. <laughs> I see your team is here. Ooh, let's give the judges a, a moment to collect their thoughts, take some notes. We've got, we've, we've got time. But I'm glad that you're here, anxious, ready to go. Ooh. All right, here we go. Our last presentation of today, this is AgZen. And AgZen, you have 10 minutes to present and then the judges will, will put their questions in the Q&A box and I will read them to you. Don't worry about trying to answer the questions in real time in the question box. And we will start with your presentation. I will time you uh, whenever you begin. Perfect. Hi everyone, we are AgZen and we're eliminating pesticide pollution. Pesticide pollution causes 200,000 deaths every year, but farmers are spraying more than ever, around 6 billion tons of pesticides globally, to keep up with rising food demand. The main reason they spray so much is because the majority of what they're spraying simply bounces or rolls off of plants due to their natural water repellency. In fact, we spray about 50 times the amount of pesticides that actually sticks to crops and contributes to protection. And this overspraying has terrible costs. Pesticide pollution leads to 5 million acute illnesses every year, causing diseases like cancer, neurological conditions, and birth defects. A disproportionate number of these deaths and illnesses are in the developing world, where a lack of protective equipment and good pesticide management makes them even more dangerous. Pesticides pollute all parts of the environment, with up to 90% of agricultural water streams in the U.S. being contaminated with them, and they represent a giant economic cost. Globally, farms spend around $60 billion a year on pesticides, as they can contribute to up to 30% of the production cost of certain crops. Now let's consider a typical customer, a large farm that has $5 million in sales, growing a crop like cotton. On average, this farm would spray about 25 tons of pesticides at a cost of $800,000 a year. Now it's important to keep in mind that this is not a high margin industry. On average, even farms of this scale make profits of less than 20%. So pesticide spending represents an enormous financial burden for farmers. Despite their high cost, farmers look at pesticides as a necessary evil. Not using enough means that they risk their crop yield, but using too much would not only burden them financially, but also compromise the safety of their workers and pollute their communities. So their goal is to spray as little pesticide as possible while maintaining yield. But this optimization becomes very difficult when this is what pesticide spraying looks like when you zoom into the plant surface. As you can see, a majority of what's sprayed is just bouncing off of the plants. Here at MIT, we've developed a solution to this problem. We take the pesticides that farmers are already spraying and separate it into two parts. We then mix these parts with food safe, oppositely charged proprietary additives, and then spray these two parts simultaneously onto the plants. When they reach the plant surface, the oppositely charged formulations react and pin the droplets to the leaves, enhancing adhesion and retention. Our formulations are made of compounds that are already approved by the EPA for agricultural use and by the FDA for safe human consumption. And they're already widely used in things like ice cream, fruit juice, and mayonnaise. Now to show you a demonstration of our technology that was featured on the BBC, on the left we are showing you how conventional spraying works. You have to spray a lot and all you end up with are these islands of easily displaced droplets. By contrast with the AgZen system, we can achieve much more uniform and retentive coatings. We've demonstrated that we can significantly reduce the volume sprayed while improving pesticide coverage. And crucially, 
Our technology merely pins the water drops that are carrying the pesticides to the plants. So once the water evaporates, the pesticides are just as easy to wash off as with conventional spraying, as we don't do anything to affect the pesticide plant interactions. This ease of wash off ensures that current post-harvest processing steps are left undisturbed. In the lab, we showed a 10X reduction in pesticide volume for a given level of desired coverage. And we've completely de-risked our product with field trials in Massachusetts, Florida, California, and Venice. Over two years, we've sprayed over 500 acres and worked with farms of various sizes. And we've demonstrated that our technology can enhance spray, re spray retention on 10 different types of crops. To demonstrate the adaptability of our approach, we built spraying systems that are a variety of scales, from backpack sprayers you see on the right to the full-scale tow-behind systems that you see in the video. Through all of our studies, we've demonstrated a 50% reduction in pesticide usage on average while maintaining crop health and yield. In addition to saving on pesticide costs, one bonus that we observed during some of our field trials was that our technology offered more robust crop protection than conventional spraying. Specifically in one study, we observed three times fewer pests on crops that were sprayed with the Ag Zen system compared to those that were sprayed with conventional spray technology, which we believe is the result of our more uniform coverage. Now, going back to our typical customer, AgZen can enable a 13 ton or $400,000 reduction in pesticide usage. And our business model is designed to capture 30% of this saved value. Our sprayer retrofits would cost our customer around a $23,000 one-time investment cost, and our additives would be priced at $120,000 a year. These numbers would mean that our customer would pay back all costs and see nearly $250,000 in savings in the very first year. A typical large farm with $5 million in sales growing a crop like cotton would see a 25% increase in their yearly profits with AgZen compared to without. We offer significantly more savings for farmers than any of our competitors, and we can start saving them money in the very first year. And unlike completing technologies, we're completely safe for the crop product, the farmers, and the environment. Adjuvants like surfactants are our main competitors. However, they offer much less savings and are inherently toxic to the environment. They also tend to make the spray droplets smaller, um, making them easier to be carried away by the wind and pollute the environment and reduce coverage on the crop. So we have significant competitive advantages. By capturing 30% of the value that we save for farmers, our addressable market is worth $9 billion globally and $2.3 billion within the US. Our initial target market consists of large farms in the US that are growing crops with high pesticide demands. And this market alone is worth around $100 million. We've talked to several customers and we've conducted our field trials in some of the largest farms in the world. They've given us some great feedback and we're on track to have the US farms that we've already worked with in our paid pilot program they'll be launching this summer. We've also been talking to regulatory agencies to establish our product as the new standard in sustainable pesticide spring. And finally, we're also in talks with agricultural manufacturing companies to help us scale up production as we launch this year. In the near term, our primary focus is to capture the largest farms in our primary beachhead market. The reason we're going after these farms is because with just 25 of them, which is about 0.2% of all the large farms in the US, we can get to $10 million in revenue. For these large farms, we plan to partner with contract manufacturers to provide our spray retrofitting kits and our formulations directly. And we're pursuing this direct sales route as we already have connections with a lot of these farms through our advisor network. We're also focusing on the segment as converting these large farms will lead to much easier sales down the road. A customer like King Ranch, for example, would have large network effects on other farms. Also, large farms are often owned by conglomerates. So converting one farm now would translate into converting many in the near future. For smaller farms, we want to leverage the distribution network of an established ag, ag manufacturer, as this would help us penetrate this highly diverse and segmented market. And we're already having talks here. Over the past year, we've also expanded our reach into the developing world um, uh, as a technology provider. We've established a partnership with an agricultural drone company in India, where we provide our retrofitting kits and formulations, and our partner handles all the sales, spraying, and operations on the ground. Through this partnership, we've been able to establish relationships with the Indian government and with large agriculture companies like Reliance and ITC, and secure three letters of intent for over 40,000 farm acres. We've been working on this technology for the last six years with support from various organizations at MIT. We've gotten about $300,000 in non-dilutive funding from startup competitions and through research grants. Our first US patent was granted earlier this year and it offers broad protection over our fundamental concept 
our methodology, a variety of our square designs, and a wide range of our formulations. We have patents pending in Europe, Japan, and India, and we have four more patent applications in the pipeline to further protect our IP. We're currently raising a round of $300,000, which we'll primarily use to expand our team, pay for pilot projects and customer acquisition costs. And our primary goal for this year is to have four major sales in the US. Later this year, we'll raise a $4 million seed round to grow rapidly towards $80 million in revenue by 2025. And this would represent a 10% capture of all the large farms in the US. At this point, we'd be an extremely attractive acquisition for various ag equipment or chemical manufacturers. And we have the team that can make this happen. My name is Vishnu, I'm the CEO of AgZen and Sridhar is our CTO. We're both final year PhD candidates and will be graduating this year with minors in business. Our chairman, Professor Kripa Varanasi, is a serial entrepreneur from companies like Liquid Glide and Infinite Cooling. And he invented this technology along with our final co-founder, Mahir, who also got his PhD from MIT. We all have prior entrepreneurship experience and we all have someone in our family who owns or runs a farm, so we know the space really well. Our advisory team has decades of experience in spray technologies, ag manufacturing, and farming. It includes the CEO of King Ranch, one of the largest farms in the US, and a senior leader at John Deere, people who all know how to launch and run companies in this space. We are AgZen, and our mission is to eliminate pesticide pollution and help farmers save $20 billion a year and boost their profits by 25% starting from year one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ag Zen. We will now move to 10 minutes of Q&A. So judges are putting their questions in the box. I will read them to you. Uh, first question, uh, is your product water soluble and or easy to wash off? And how do crops remain protected after rain? So um, fundamentally what we're doing, so uh, the way our technology works is that we mix our additives into the formulations along with the water. So yes, it does get mixed in with the water. Uh, fundamentally how we save farmers money and how we're reducing pesticide pollution is to make the application phase more efficient. So we pin the water drops that are carrying the pesticides to the plants and therefore we reduce the amount of pesticides that farmers need to spray overall to achieve their desired level of coverage. Now, as I mentioned, once the water evaporates, we don't do anything to affect the pesticide plant interaction, but because we save a lot of pesticides in the application step, we can always save farmers 50%, regardless of rain or whether it gets washed off during, uh, during regular operations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, do you plan to provide a guarantee on the farmer's economics? Uh, if yes, how would you monitor that? Uh, That's a great question. So we've already done during all of our field trials, we've been carefully monitoring how efficient we are on every single type of crop that we test. So we take detailed coverage measurements, and then we show these measurements back to the farmer. We show, hey, as, as we reduce volume, how our coverage remains the same. So these are all things that we're baking into the reports that we give our farmers in addition to the savings as well. Uh, as far as a um, guarantee goes, we, we have all the data from all of our field trials, which is what we'll use to show farmers and also when we go to their farms, we'll demonstrate this technology directly on their, on their crops. So that we feel like is the most powerful way to convince farmers. Thank you. Okay, next question, it's a little long. Okay. Okay, can you explain the difference between the 10 times reduction seen in testing and the 50% reduction seen in the field? Is there an opportunity to bring this uh, two times the two X closer to 10 X. It's a fantastic question. And yes, there is. The short answer is we're working constantly to enhance the efficiency of our field test, uh, field scale sprayers. So in the lab, we can control a lot of things, right? We can control all the angles, all the spray uh, criteria. There's no wind. There's nothing like that affecting our sprays. So we are able to achieve that 10 X reduction in pesticide volume for the same level of coverage in the field. Uh, even our first generation of sprayers have been uh, able to achieve 50% um, savings. So going forward, we, we definitely think that we can get closer to this 10x number as we continue to optimize our design. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what steps are you taking or what is your approach to verify the sustainability aspect of the product? Uh, are there any uh, general health implications? That's a great question. So. We've actually, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, have tested a variety of pesticides with a variety of our formulations. And all of our formulations 
are inherently, they're bio-derived in some way. So they're environmentally degradable. So they're biodegradable. And at the same time, they're food safe. They're already approved by the EPA for agricultural use, by the FDA for consumption. And they're already widely used. If you've ever eaten ice cream or mayonnaise or fruit juice, you've consumed some of this stuff already. So we foresee that in the future going forward, we're not going to have any concerns with respect to, you know, uh, biodegradability, this thing will be, um, or environmental concerns, or even consumption concerns. Uh, and we've been very careful to do that across a wide range of our formulations as well. Thank you. Okay, another one slightly longer. Uh, can the pesticide itself be put into two batches, ionized and sprayed with your sprayers, achieving the same effect? If so, what are the pesticide manufacturers' barriers to your target market? So it's actually very difficult if you start modifying the pesticide composition, because fundamentally the point of the pesticide is to protect against pests, right? They want to make sure that the plants don't get affected by pests and their, the chemical compositions and things like that are very carefully controlled. And um, a typical pesticide takes about $180 million in 10 years of research and development to develop. So trying to change that up to include this would be difficult, one. And second, we also have fundamental protection in our IP over the concept of oppositely charged formulations and spraying them to enhance retention. So we have significant barriers to entry there. And Part of the reason why we chose this approach is because we didn't want to fundamentally change anything about the pesticides. There's years of research and development and farmer trust that goes into pesticide formulations. So we didn't want to affect that. We just wanted to make the application process a lot more efficient and help farmers save money. So that's why we chose this approach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, what do you envision as your next product? So our next product is essentially the products that we've already worked on. It's, it's making, uh, these uh, boom scale sprayers and getting them out to customers. Right now, we're really focused on these paid pilots the, later this summer and getting these four major sales done by the end of the year. And we already have a variety of sprayer designs. So we can spray things like trees using fan sprayers. We can do uh, leaf coverage uh, using boom scale sprayers. So we really want to find customers and uh, get our product out to them. That's our main focus. And as we go forward in terms of technical development, we're going to be trying to go towards that 10x reduction, as I mentioned earlier, by enhancing the efficiency of our sprayers and also by optimizing our formulations a little bit more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Can you talk about your projected revenue split between selling hardware versus licensing to other hardware manufacturers? Uh, so we are primarily focusing right now on selling directly to these large scale farms. So um, our revenue, as I mentioned, for, um, for a single large scale farm of $5 million, our CapEx for this large farm would be about $23,000 as a one-time investment. And our additives would be priced at around $120,000 a year. Uh, we can comfortably operate a greater than 50% margin in this area, but we're also focused on partnering with someone like um, some, uh, an established ag manufacturer, someone like John Deere. The reason for that is their distribution network will be super helpful to us as we try to expand to other farms. Uh, there's millions of farms in the U.S. and getting to them through this distribution network would be very favorable. But our primary goal is to focus on these direct sales to these large customers because with just 25 of them, we can get to $10 million in revenue. So that's kind of what we're focused on immediately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Um, you said currently farmers use 50 times uh, pesticide volume. If that's it, get... If that gets cut in half, as you showed, what do you think the reaction will be of the pesticide industry? Are they going to try and acquire you and shut you down or bring you on as a partner? So this is a great question. We've actually had a few uh, conversations with pesticide manufacturers and uh, talked to different uh, people at these places. So it's not that simple, right? Because one, if one of them partners with us, they'll have a huge competitive advantage giving them much more control over a much larger per percentage of the market that they currently now struggle with because pesticides are an extremely competitive industry. So there has been interest from their end to try to you know, see how they can collaborate with us. But at the end of the day, I, I think we'll go back to our fundamental motivation here. Um, 200,000 uh, 200, deaths and 5 million illnesses. And the fact that farmers are overspending and financially burdened are the fundamental problems here. And we definitely need to solve them. And that's why we're passionate about solving this problem and trying to go directly to the farmers 
and through partners will help make this vision a reality. So it's not as simple as, hey, we reduce their volume so they don't like us. It's not that simple because they do like us because they, we could make them much more competitive. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, what testing have you done or what testing is needed uh, related to whether the pesticides are not absorbed or retained in the plant causing potential health issues? That's a great question. So especially in our field trials in Massachusetts, we had a very hard look at phytotoxicity. So we had a look at plant growth rates, discoloration, leaf foliage, all of those things as we were doing our field trials. And we saw no differences between conventional spraying and our technology, which is very uh, indicative that our additives haven't done anything to change the way the pesticide works. In one trial, we did show that we were more effective at uh, rejecting pests. That was because just of our more uniform coverage on the plant. So the pests had less room to go and attack the plant surfaces. But in general, we don't affect anything about that. And we have data from these two years of field trials where we've tested these 10 different types of crops, uh, looking at plant health as well as a key criteria in addition to yield. Thank you. Uh, are your additives protected by patents? And if so, uh, in what countries? So we already have a U.S. patent granted, as I mentioned. Uh, it, it offers this broad uh, scale protection over a number of the formulations that we could use. We're very careful in drafting our patents to ensure that we have good competitive advantage that lasts for a long time. Uh, and that's from our prior experience that Kripa has from his, old, uh, from his other startups as well. Um, and currently we have applications pending in Europe, Japan, and in India. And we have four more patent applications in the pipeline as well which will incorporate some of these efficiency enhancements and things like that, that we've been working on over the past few years. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions about uh, organic uh, agriculture. So what is, what's the impact uh, on your business of the growing number of organic farms, if any? So the, um, the market numbers that we gave you are with extremely current numbers. So this is all with pesticide usage data from 2019, 2020 um, in the, globally in the US and also that $100 million beachhead market that we gave you for crops like cotton, uh, nut crops and things like that that have high pesticide demands. These are all extremely current numbers. So we're very confident that going forward over the next few years that the trend towards organic farming doesn't diminish the amount of benefit that we can have and our market size uh, and how much revenue we can generate. I would add that organic farms also use uh, spray pesticides. They're not chemical pesticides, but they use natural pesticides that they also spray and they have the exact same problem. So this product would be applicable to those as well. Perfect. All right, Thanks, thank you. That's all the time we have for Q&A. Thank you to Agzin. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you to the judges for all of your questions. And that is the end of our final round of the 2021 RBPC. Thank you to all of our startups who pitched today for your excellent presentations and your very spot on answers of the judges questions. Uh, the numerous judges' questions that came in. Uh, judges, it's now time for you to navigate to the judging platform to start thinking about your scores and how you uh, are going to rate the seven, rank, excuse me, the seven startups you've seen. Uh, remember that one is for excellent and seven is for least potential investment opportunity. Uh, please make sure you click submit on your scores. Those will be due by 12.15. Uh, and we are going to take a break and tell our awards uh, presentation. But before we do, judges, I would ask two things of you uh, and everyone watching. Please continue to hang out here for a moment so we can play you our Greater Houston Partnership video about the city of Houston, Texas. And judges, please, before 12.30, please head over to the showcase in Whova. This is the uh, showcase booths of all the startups. We would love for you to vote on your three favorites. There is money at stake there. So head over to the showcase booths in Whova and vote on your favorite three startups. So now, before we head out, I'd like to play our Greater Houston Partnership video uh, from our sponsor, the Greater Houston Partnership.
doers, game changers, problem solvers, risk takers, Houstonians. We hail from every part of the country and every corner of the world, creating a global diversity and way of life that is uniquely Houston and world-class. While our shared roots are proudly planted in Texas, Houston's reach and influence is truly global. We're a modern cosmopolitan city where all cultures and customs are invited to blossom and contribute. A city where diversity isn't a goal, it's a vital thread in the tapestry of our community. A city where dreamers become doers and ideas become innovations that truly change the world. In Houston, we don't just reach for the stars. We invent the technologies and build the tools that take us there. From pioneering medical breakthroughs to leading the transition to a more sustainable, lower carbon world, we solve the problems that matter most. Our business-friendly pro-growth mindset supports both global corporations and disruptive startups alike. Houstonians enjoy the rich cultural amenities, unparalleled cuisine, and lush green spaces of a sophisticated global city, but at a cost of living well below the national average. Houston's exceptional quality of life, coupled with professional opportunity, attracts top-tier talent from around the world. And our strong educational systems, with nationally ranked universities, graduate schools, and community colleges, produce a workforce that is second to none. Our unique convergence of people, industries, and cultures are the key ingredients to our thriving economy and global competitiveness. In Houston, we do more than connect you to the world. We bring the world to you.